Okay, let's get started. So today we are going to finish up our lectures about processing memory, and we are going to talk about uh, a topic that is really dear to my heart, uh, processing using memory. I'm a PhD student here in the Safari Research Group in ETH for five years already, and I've been doing my thesis on this topic. So we are going to talk a lot about uh, several of the papers that I have published uh, during this time, and also other related research and uh, hopefully you can get inspired about the processing memory and processing using memory domain as a whole. So before we start, uh, we have an invitation. We have a Safari Live seminar from Professor Yang Jin Li on the 17th of October at 6 p.m. Uh, she's a professor at the University of, of Chicago and she's going to talk about some reliability uh, issues that happened for deep neural network accelerators. And she's going to talk about her findings about the uh, bit flips that she have found in the field and also solutions and techniques to mitigate those, um, uh, those issues. And that talk is going to be live stream on YouTube and you can, these slides are going to be available in the website. You can just click and feel free to watch and join and ask us questions. So, so this is the agenda for today. I'm going to first give a recap of what we've been talking so far related to processing memory, the motivation of processing memory, and then what we, Juan, have discussed in the previous weeks about processing near memory. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the other alternative, which is processing using memory, conclude, and finally talk a little bit about how it's likely to do research on this particular topic or in this field. So let's get started. Uh, feel free to stop me at any point uh, to ask questions. We have a lot of slides to cover, um, but I'm going to try to uh, have a good pace over here. But again, feel free to stop at any point. So the motivation that uh, we are dealing with uh, in, the in the previous lectures is that the data movement in today's systems is a major uh, bottleneck. And this is becoming worse and worse because you need to move data across really long uh, and power hungry uh, inter interconnect networks to process uh, a few amounts of, the, uh, of bytes. And this consumes a lot of uh, energy into the systems, even from, from your phone to data centers, independently on the type of computer system that you might have. And as I'm going to show later, previous slide that we have actually showed, actually uh, this data movement uh, dominates the energy consumption for many key applications. And, and again, if you think about your phone, this is a problem because you have limited battery in your phone. And if you think about a data center, uh, you can imagine that uh, the much energy that you can save in a data center uh, is going to save you some, a uh, lot of dollars uh, uh, in the overall view of the data center in the end of the month. Uh, so the observation that we have here is that we have uh, the data movement not only cause energy problems, but also cause a lot of uh, latency problems because ZRAM, as I'm going to show later on in this lecture, uh, is uh, the main memory technology that you use for, for main memory to store data. And you need to move data from a, a really high latency memory device, a DRAM chip, into your CPU caches and your registers, which operate at much faster speeds. But that data movement in the end consumes uh, the most of the performance or most of the latency to perform a particular computation. And we have an opportunity here that was not um, uh, proposed nowadays. It's actually an old solution that has been proposed since the 70s. And uh, that is to move the computation where the data resides. So instead of moving the data from the DRAM, from the flash into the CPU to perform any computation, we are going to move the computation to the DRAM, to the flash, to the storage, to the computation where the data resides. And we have many terms of, you're going to see in the literature, many names for this technique, processing memory, memory computing, memory processing, the data processing, computing memory, processing memory, processing using DRAM, and all of them fundamentally mean the same thing. Just move doing the computation where the data is placed initially, so you don't move it. So, uh, we have also these four key components that we want to have in a system that we've been talking about. And this is one of them, uh, processing memory is one of them. Uh, fundamentally energy efficiency architectures is memory-centered computing systems that can provide us the three 
uh, properties in the system at the same time. You want to have high performance, we, have, we want to have energy efficiency, and you want to be sustainable. And you, do want to, you don't want to choose one of them. You want to choose all of the three uh, um, concurrently for a particular system. So this is a problem in today's systems again, because we are uh, not designing, think about those three components at the same time. And this creates this energy and latency problem that I'm talking about. And, uh, and this, all of this, again, is because we're doing computation far away from a memory. So this is a, some slide that was already in previous lecture. You might recall this. This is a work from Google uh, data centers. They profile uh, their data centers and the key applications over there. Uh, and they saw that actually a great part of the, of the time that, the, that that particular application is just waiting for memory to be moved. Uh, from DRAM, from flash into the CPU cores for computation themselves. And this happens because a memory access consumes not only a lot of latency, but also consumes uh, two or two, three order of magnitude more energy than doing a addition, for example. All of this uh, we show in previous lectures, then also this is study that we did that with uh, mobile applications, uh, also for Google workloads that shows that 60% uh, of the energy is spent only in this data movement. So we need to revise this uh, approach of doing computation. Of, we need to revise the way that we are doing computation today if you want to mitigate that energy and performance problems. And this requires uh, actually a paradigm uh, shift. So we need to enable computation with minimal data movement and do the computation where the data is uh, currently located. And, and this leads us to the uh, processing memory solution. So we have this uh, uh, this primer uh, book chapter actually in our website. I think it's part of your homework lecture to read some chapters of it. And over there we describe this processing memory uh, architecture or processing memory solution in details. And and over there we describe two different processing memory approaches. Uh, what we call processing using memory and processing near memory. So processing near memory is what Juan have talked in the previous lecture so far. So over there, you are going to have a system. You have your regular CPUs, you have your regular DRAMs, and you are going to have a DRAM chip where you are going to put some cores inside those, those, pink, uh, inside those DRAM models themselves. So we don't need to uh, actually do, uh, bring the data from this DRAM to the, to, from this CPU to do any computation. We can directly operate in the, in, in the cores placing this pin enabled memory. Uh, and, not, and this particular organization here is what one talked in the last lecture, uh, the OpMEMS architecture, right? That um, this French startup have come up with and actually just got some uh, new funding to accelerate also machine learning workload. So there's a lot of like, actually um, um, the industry is looking at this particular type of architecture nowadays this is really cutting edge uh, for applications like large language models that requires a lot of this data movement. So another solution for machine learning is from Samsung uh, that we discussed in previous lectures that actually again uh, add some this is a 3D stack memory device, a hybrid bandwidth uh, memory HBM chip. And over there, they include some co uh, convolution uh, engines to accelerate convolution neural networks. Uh, and this is actually fabricated. This is actually an old slide from 2021. Uh, Samsung gave a talk actually uh, in 2023 in one conference. And over there, they, pro they showed that uh, three other organizations or three other architectures, uh, uh, particular designed for larger language models that follow this type of organization, this processing near memory type of uh, setup. And this is another solution from uh, Samsung called iXTeam. Over here uh, is for recommendation systems, another machine learning application. Again, they are included some, yeah, this is, you can see the chip and inside the chip you have some, inside this buffer die here, we have some uh, engine that does, um, is again, is some accumulation based operation in the memory device itself. This is another solution from SK Hynix. SK Hynix is pushing a lot this, this particular architecture again for uh, neural networks. And this is uh, from Alibaba for their servers. They also looking at processing near memory solutions. So this is what we discussed so far. All of what is coming from all of those organizations is that we have a memory chip and inside the memory chip, we have some engine. Uh, UpMem uses general purpose computing cores. These other uh, Samsung, SK Hynix and Alibaba uses 
some specialized accelerators to accelerate a particular application, neural network, mostly in those cases. But you still have some distinction between what is memory and what is logic. The main difference is that they are placed together either in the same chip or in the same package or in the same model. Uh, and even though this is enough to provide us some benefits and minimize some of that data movement bottleneck that we've been talking about in the initial uh, slides, uh, uh, fundamentally, this is quite similar to what you expect from your CPU. You're still having a distinction between what is computation and what is logic. Uh, we are going to talk now about the processing using memory approach, where actually you're going to remove this, uh, this restriction. We are going to use the memory themselves to do computation. So before, uh, I want to ask if there is any question about the recap that for processing near memory solutions. Okay, I guess not. So let's jump into the what is this processing using memory? So the, in the, the main definition of processing using memory is that we are going to use the operational principles of the memory uh, cells themselves to perform computation. So you are going to use the Durham cells to do computation or the flash cells to do computation without adding any other logic. It does not mean that we are not going to, to change a little bit of the design of the array cells so we can do computation more efficiently. That is possible. But all of that is just to support the computation. The computation is still is done by uh, just using the cells uh, uh, themselves. So this is uh, much, uh, in many cases, much better than processing near memory solutions because here we actually are fundamentally uh, solving the data movement problem. So you're not moving data at all. The data is stored there. We are doing computation there. And also you can have, instead of doing computation in a digital domain, you are going to do computation in the analog domain. We have, we have some properties as well uh, related to speed and related to, to energy efficiency. Uh, so we are I'm, in this lecture here, we're going to talk about several examples. And uh, right now those names does not mean anything to you, uh, but they are going to mean soon. Uh, and this is some uh, field of research that we started in this group in, from 2013 and is still uh, is, 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 is going on. Uh, as I said, I'm just doing my PhD thesis on this topic. So let's start simple. Let's just say that we want to do data copy and data initialization without the need to move data. Uh, so data copy, just imagine that you have two arrays, a source array and a destination array, and I want to copy the source data to the destination data. It's that simple. And initialization, let's say that I have, I want to initialize an array with zeros and I want to just store zeros in an array. So these two operations. So those operations are quite important in particular in data centers. A lot of time, uh, this is some works that shows that, uh, that Google or like other data centers are spending a lot of time or propose accelerators just to do these two type of computation, initialization and also data copy. And, and, and this, even though, again, it's just two primary operations, there are many parts of your system that does that. So when you do a bunch of uh, system, operating system support, like uh, virtual memory cloning and duplicating, checkpointing, forking, page migration, all of that requires to do initialization and, uh, and, and, and book data copying. And that is this work that shows that 5% of the cycles spending Google data centers are because of all of this. Uh, you might think that 5% is small, but you need to think that, that this is a Google data center that has thousands uh, of uh, hundreds of thousands of computers. So if you can reduce this 5% to zero, it's already a good uh, benefit that you're going to provide. So how this is done, this book data copy, for example, is done in today's systems, right? So here is, there is a diagram of the system. You have your CPU, your cache, your memory controller, your main memory. So you want to copy the data is stored in the memory. You want to copy some da the data from this white box to the green box. In today's systems, you need the CPU is going to read a cache line at a time into the caches uh, from the source data. Then it's going to read another cache line from the memory into the caches so the destination data is going to do the swapping or the copying from those two cache lines. And then the data is going to be evicted back to the main memory. So uh, the, the CPU is in, in terms of computation is doing almost nothing, right? It's just uh, copying or like feeding one uh, cache line with the other cache line. But in today's systems, for you to do that, this is going to incur quite like high latency because you need to traverse through this off chip bus, through the cache hierarchy until you get to the CPU, cache line by cache line for the data that you need to copy. 
And uh, you're also going to have a bandwidth limitation because the interconnected connects your main memory, your main memory to your uh, CPU die is limited. So you have number limit number of pins that can transmit the data. And then at, at some point you're going to be bottlenecked by those pins. Uh, you're also going to create what is called cache pollution. So your cache is going to fill with a lot of cache lines that later on your application might not use. And then it's going to create cache misses, which is going to uh, hurt performance for the entire system. And it's going to create this unwanted data movement because in the end, we just want to move the, uh, uh, the white uh, blocks into the, the main memory itself. So if you do this in today's systems, this takes around to move one cache, one page or four kilobytes of data from uh, one address to the other. It takes around uh, 1,000 nanoseconds and it takes 3.6 uh, microjoules to do this, comp uh, this particular computation. So let's imagine a system now that uh, your or memory device has uh, the capability to do, of doing some uh, proxy memory. And, and then you can simply copy, I uh, tell my memory, cop address zero to address one. And then my memory goes and simply copy the pages. This is going to be low, lat low latency because I'm not moving any data from the off interconnects or to the cache. This is going to uh, be used uh, low bandwidth because I'm not transmitting any data to those limit amount of things that I just mentioned. Uh, there is no cache pollution because the cache is not involved at all. And there is no one on data movement. And then this 1K uh, nanoseconds uh, goes through 90 nanoseconds and my energy goes from 3.6 to 0 0.04. So uh, we are going to design the system uh, from this sli next slide zone. Uh, is there any question? Yeah, I guess uh, the, the problem is more or less clear. Okay, how can you do that then? Uh, before we start, uh, we are going to give a, give a brief uh, introduction on DRAM. Uh, who here uh, actually knows how uh, DRAM is a model or chip is designed? One person, good, two. Okay, really good. Uh, now you're going to, so just for me to know how much background I should give because it's really important that this is understood, so the processing using memory uh, uh, proposals are going to be, uh, it makes more, way more sense after that's understood. So before I explain how that system uh, is going to be built, we are going to see inside a DRAM chip. So you have a DRAM model, uh, a DIN that you buy uh, on the store or you look at your PCs inside there. Uh, this Dura model usually is green, and there is also some blue ones. I never saw purple or any other color. Maybe there are some, I don't know. Uh, usually they are green. Uh, so a DRAM model has several DRAM chips uh, or inside them. And a DRAM chip is uh, have several DRAM banks inside those chips. A DRAM bank itself is composed of sev uh, several DRAM uh, cells. And those DRAM cells are laid out in a 2D array. Uh, horizontally, uh, those DRAM cells are all connected to what is called a word line, and vertically, those DRAM cells are connected to what is called a, a bit line. So the bit lines are connected to an array of sense amplifiers, which are called robot, uh, and we, we together are, is called a row buffer. And the DRAM cell itself is, uh, is based on a storage capacitor. So this is the capacitor from physics that you learn, like two plates. This, it's not implemented with two parallel plates, but over here is a bit more complex, but the principles is the same. Uh, so you have a capacitor-based storage, uh, a SS transistor, which gives you access the, uh, through to the, the, the voltages or the, the charge store inside this storage capacitor, and, uh, uh, and a bit line. So this is the overall organization of a DRAM chip. This is another view of a DRAM chip itself. Uh, again, you have the bank. Inside the banks, you have several uh, uh, arrays of DRAM or row of DRAM cells connected to a row buffer. And uh, a bank is constitute what is called a uh, subarray. So we have several of those subarrays themselves. And the, uh, the subarrays inside the bank share some uh, IO logic to, to bring the data from the subarray into the chip. And the banks inside the chip also share some IO logic to bring the data from the chip outside into the memory controller. So with this structure, I'm going to explain now how a DRAM operation or how a cell operation uh, happens when you actually are accessing your DRAM chip. So there are three main uh, operations that uh, a memory controller is going to perform 
so that you can read or write data into your Durham chip. Um, those are called activation or read and write, regular read and write, and pre-charge. So it starts with the activation. So again, this is the same organization that I described before. Have the storage capacitor here, the system amplifier, uh, the word line, the access transistor, and the bit line. So initially, uh, the bit line is held into a reference voltage, which is uh, usually half of VDD of that particular device. And once the memory controller issues are uh, activate com commands, uh, the DRAM device is going to operate in several steps. So the first one, the word line is going to be accessed. So we are going to enable this particular transistor, uh, which is going to allow the storage capacitor to lose charge to the bit line. So they are going to have a delta charge uh, perturbation to this half VDD uh, into the, uh, into the uh, word uh, bit line voltage. So the sense amplifier is enabled. And once it's enabled, it's going to amplify this difference in, that is was sense uh, that was put in the into the bit line with the charge that was stored in the storage capacitor. Uh, so this uh, deviation can either go uh, to a positive degree, so it goes to, uh, to VDD, uh, so it was initially stored uh, some voltage there, or it can be a negative, so it can go back to zero uh, in case uh, this, the level of storage store in the storage capacitor is below a particular threshold. So as you saw in the animation here, when this happens, the storage capacitor loses its charge uh, because now it's connected and creates a path through uh, the bit line. And so the last step is actually this amplifier is going to drive back the amplified voltage inside the storage capacitor. So the what is called uh, a charge restoration. So the initial charge of the storage capacitor is restored. So this is what happens during uh, activation. Uh, so the word line is assessed, the storage capacitor loses charge to the bit line, the bit line, uh, this amplifier um, amplifies that difference in voltage either to VDD or to zero, and the storage regain its original uh, voltage level. So then after that, the data is going to be latched in this sense amplifier, and then the memory controller can issue some read and write requests to read the data that was latched in the sense amplifier. So once the memory controller is done issuing the reads and write requests, to the particular row that you are reading. Recall that all of these, there are several rows operating parallel. Uh, the memory controller needs to prepare the DRAM uh, for a next access to a, part, to a different row in the same subarray. And to do that, this, the, it issues a pre-charge command. So pre-charge command is basically going to restore everything to the initial state that I started. So it's going to disable the word line. It's going to disable the the sense amplifier, and it's going to put the bit line voltage back to that reference voltage, to half of VDD. Um, so then after that, the DRAM uh, sense amplifier can receive a request to a different row from this one that was currently being accessed. So those are the three main components of uh, accessing a DRAM array itself. Is there any question on how this works? So you are going to build on this to do that particular computation that I talked about before. Uh, so the main idea here is that uh, when I issue, I have the activate and, and then I have a pre-charge, right? And if I want to, to issue a, a request to a different role, I'm going to send another activate and another pre-charge. The main idea here is that I'm not going to issue that middle activation. I'm going to activate a role. And then after activating that row, I'm going to send another activation to a different row. And this is going to make, it's going to force the data to be copied from one row to another one to the, to the bit line. So here I have uh, more or less uh, a description of a DRAM cell again. Uh, here they have all of those cells connected together in parallel. Usually we have uh, four, um, four or eight kilobytes of, uh, of, of, of data in a particular row. And, and then we are going to do that, uh, those steps that uh, I just mentioned. So the first step, we are going to copy the, uh, we are going to activate that row, as I just mentioned. This is going to bring the data to, into the row buffer. Uh, it's exactly the same what I just described before. And now we are, you are going to activate another row, uh, which is the destination node that we are interested on. So this is going to force the data that is stored currently in this row buffer here into that row that I just activated. In this way, actually what I'm doing is copying row A into row B with those two sequence of uh, activations. Uh, so this 
is what we the the the, the, the primitive way of doing processing memory. So we are just uh, issuing two activates to, and, and not issuing a precharge between them. And this is allowing to do that operation that I talked before, that initial uh, uh, row copy or initialization without the intervention of the CPU. See here, the CPU didn't touch anything other than send those activate and precharge commands. Uh, this reduced latency also increases uh, 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 energy efficiency compared to a baseline system. So here is another uh, uh, description of how this is working. Again, here uh, we have that uh, bit line is to, uh, with the reference voltage at VVD over two. We have a source uh, the, uh, cell storing a one or sorry, some high voltage and a destination cell is storing low voltage. So I activate the first row, uh, the source row, the data is moved uh, into the, uh, from the cell into the sense amplifier. Now the sense amplifier see the perturbation. Uh, and now that uh, in, in this simplifier, I have uh, uh, the data from the initial uh, row that was activated. Then without issuing a precharge, I send another uh, activation to the destination row. And now the data that was stored uh, in this simplifier is going to be copied to the destination row. So this is, as you see, is a really simple mechanism. Uh, I don't know if there is any any question. It, it it's, it's, At first, it's, it's really simple, but... It took some time for people to understand that, uh, how this actually works. But hopefully at a high level, you understood. Uh, we are going to build from there. Um, so again, this is just another way of showing uh, how that works. First, you send activate to the, the source row, then activate to the destination row, and that copies the data from the row buffer into the destination row. And uh, this mechanism that I just described I was proposed in this paper from 2013 that is called row clone. It's row clone, as you can imagine, because you're cloning a row. Uh, and this is uh, it, this all operates inside a DRAM subarray that to the array of DRAM cells that I mentioned in the background slides. So what happens if you want to move the data from one uh, one bank to another bank? So as as you can see from the figure here, this uh, this copy is only possible because uh, the that source and destination row are sharing the same row buffer, right? But uh, when you have rows across different banks, they are not sharing the same row. They, are, they have their own row buffer. So what row clone proposes to move data from uh, one bank to another is to use the share uh, interconnect that connects the different banks um, at the same time. So you activate a row and then you do a bunch of reads uh, into uh, one row uh, in one bank to another row in another bank. And then uh, the data copy uh, uh, happens. Uh, in the in the is not in this slides here. Maybe you cannot see clearly, but underlining the underlying mechanism that is behind this is the same as the one that I just explained. Everything is based in this concept of uh, charge sharing. So again, you improve some latency and reduce energy compared to a baseline CPU system. So you can generalize this uh, if you want to move data across or enter a subarray. We are going to do to activate to the to to issue to activate commands to the source and destination row uh, inside the subarray. Uh, if you want to copy data across different uh, banks, you are going to what is called uh, pipeline uh, uh, pipeline zero modes uh, in the paper. We are going to basically pipe. We are going to do the activation and then you are going to pipeline the the cache lines across the share interconnect that connects different banks inside the subarray. And, uh, and then if you want to do inter subarray row copy, you're going to use uh, the interbank uh, mechanism twice to copy the bank. You're going to fix this in the next slides. Uh, so this incur really low area costs. Uh, actually, the only uh, thing that you need to put to, to, to make this work is some redesign on the on the some on some IO logic to to this uh, this for this to operate so it's 0.01 percent on top of a DRAM array and uh, there are some uh, great benefits as you can see here 11 times uh, uh, latency reduction compared to your CPU and uh, 64 64 uh, for, uh, 74 times uh, energy savings compared to your CPU. Uh, this also you can do the same mechanism for initialization. Sorry, you have a question. Or if they are put in there, they already exist. Uh, so if I go back to the background slides, uh, 
this is why this figure is here. So yeah, so these interconnect that is shared across the banks, they already exist because the data needs to be moved uh, from the banks into the chip IO and from the chip IO to the memory channel itself. Uh, so this, this interconnect already is already there. Uh, it's, it's basically a bus, it's nothing fancy. Uh, is there any other question? Yes. Yes. So let's go back to the slides. Yes, it's these slides here, right? So the intra subarray is the source and the destination row must be placed inside the same subarray. Uh, so initially, when you are locating data in an application, the operating system is going to make some decisions where data is placed. So the, that decision must guarantee that the search and the destination are in the same subarray. This is where row clone gives its best uh, performance. This is the mechanism that I show in there a lot of animations. So the in, interbank, uh, I think this one you understood, is across the sub, different subarrays across different banks using the interconnects. And then uh, the case where we, like the subarrays inside the bank, they don't share any path or they share a buzz actually. Uh, but they don't. There is they don't. There is no interconnect between different subarrays inside the same bank, uh, and this is why there is this inter uh, subarray row copy. So it's inside the subarray in the same bank uh, versus in different subarrays in different banks. Uh, those are different uh, uh, mechanisms. I don't know if it was clear. The inter and intra can be confusing. Intra is inside and inter is external. So, uh, so external to a sub, the source and the destination is external in different subarrays. And in the other case, the source and destination roles are internal to the same subarray. Hopefully that clarify more or less. Sure. Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, I guess uh, we are going to have some uh, uh, lectures after this one about memory design or memory latency. Uh, usually, the, uh, the more uh, let me let me go back to the the is important to show this actually. So here we have the several. You can just keep increasing the number of 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 of, of cells, right? In a in a in a bit connected to a bit line, but the more that increase uh, this number of cells, the more powerful your system amplifier needs to be because you are going to have some uh, capacitance of the bit line themselves uh, over here, and the larger the system amplifier, the larger your chip, and then it at, that is a design point where it's not uh, beneficial anymore uh, because uh, also uh, the latency of amplifying because of that capacitance is going to increase. So there's a trade-off over there with the size, the number of cells that you can put, the capacitance that that generates, the latency of the amplifier, and like the overall density that you can get. So it's kind of a, like a, a balance that uh, the, the memory manufacturers find where they find where is the ideal number of rows that they can put together. So this is why they cannot just build like a huge single chip uh, that is going to like minimize like this data movement or like this you would simplify our design, right? So I don't know if that was explained, but is is more or less because of that. Uh, the larger the larger the number of cells in a bit line, the the larger the simplifier, and this requires more latency, and which we don't want, right? This is already really uh, high latency. Yes. <laughs> Okay, stop. Is there any further questions? Yes, no problem. They don't exist. Yes. We are going to talk about that uh, in the in the in another uh, slides soon. Uh, as you see here. What we are doing for the inter, I think I didn't talk too much about that actually. So here for to move things, uh, uh, if your source and your destination uh, are in different subarrays inside a single bank, you basically have to do this interbank data movement twice, uh, which is going to include a lot of latency. So if in the, in the I went to really briefly into this, but uh, here is the latency plot, right? This is the 
uh, inter subarray, across subarray, the, the purple one. So as you can see, there is no much benefit because actually you're not minimizing data movement. You're actually having to move a lot of data from one bank to another bank. This is like a temporary bank. And then you move back to the subarray and then you do the copying. So it's not that beneficial. Uh, it's, uh, there is some benefit in terms of energy, but in terms of latency is not beneficial at all. But we are going to uh, solve that uh, in a few slides. Any other question? Okay, really good that you guys uh, engage. Uh, so, as you can uh, think about, uh, this also can be, uh, the same technique can be done for that um, row initialization problem that I mentioned in the beginning. You basically can keep a row with zeros or ones on, and then you just keep doing copies to initialize other destination rows as, as needed by the operating system or by the application. So, uh, I guess this is just a summary. Uh, this uh, initialization can be done with any arbitrary data. And zero initialization is the most common thing that you're going to find in servers, for example. And this, uh, by doing that, you can reduce the latency of, uh, um, of, of zero initialization by uh, six times and uh, 41.5 uh, lower energy uh, in, in the uh, evaluated applications. And here again, we have some uh, results that we have in the paper. I'm not going to go through them in the details on how much that copy and zeroing can reduce the latency and also the energy of the system. Uh, again, this is just showing that this in the x-axis here we have real applications like um, uh, MySQL my or uh, mCache. Those are uh, database applications, have boot up of your system or compile or fork benches to fork different threads in a particular application. And you can see that those particular applications, this is the memory traffic. And this part for these applications, you do spend a lot of time on doing zeroing and copying. So just to show that this is an important problem. And, and as you can see, when you, accelerate, when you use this uh, AMP row clone proposal to accelerate these applications, we get really high uh, 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 benefits compared to a baseline system. So uh, row clone to operate, even though it's a really simple mechanism, it requires solutions or it spans uh, um, um, the entire computing stack. Uh, from the application down to the row clone, because now your application needs to be able to tell your DRAM that you, know, you want to send two activations to the search and destination row together. So you need to find a path from the application into that DRAM uh, chip themselves. And this path does not exist because the system is not is just seeing DRAM as, as, a, as a slave mechanism. So it's not allowing that you don't, there's no way for you in your application C says like, oh, uh, Connect to my DRAM and now activate this particular rules. This is uh, oblivious to the to the to the application themselves. So now we need to to figure out solutions to how to communicate uh, those uh, occurrences of row clop of uh, and, uh, on initializations across the stack. How to ensure cache coherence? We, this, we didn't have the slides about cache coherence yet, but uh, the problem of cache coherence here is that what happens if I just tell my DRAM to copy one row to another row, uh, and then uh, I have some stale data in my cache from the source row, for example, right? So now I have to, I have like this deep cache hierarchies with three different memories. I need to first figure out, is my source row in DRAM uh, storing the most uh, updated version of the data, or is there some data push, uh, also in the cache that I need to, to write back to DRAM before doing this row copy initialization before. So this creates a problem uh, over there. Uh, also, um, th this is really tied to how you maximize the latency energy savings because if the majority of your row actually that you want to decop is in the cache, you're going to spend a lot of time just writing back that, date, that dirty data into the DRAM before you do that copy. And then you're going to reduce your uh, energy save that you're going to get because you're not eliminating data movement. You're creating more actually. And, uh, and how to handle data reuse, right? Is it related to the case as well? We are going to touch some of those things in this lecture, but not all of them. And just uh, 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 fruit for thought. So this is the paper that was published in, in micro 2013. Uh, a lecture that owner gave on uh, row clone. And what I want to highlight here is that now we are moving to this, um, to this um, mindset where we want to have uh, some specialized computing capability in my memory itself. And I want to be able to not only store data in memory, but I also want to tell to my memory, copy data, uh, copy with zeros, copy with ones. Uh, and later on, I want to tell my memory, 
uh, do addition or do a subtraction. I don't want it only to just be sitting there in store memory. So it's, it just creates, gives more power to the memory device itself. So uh, some strengths of the paper uh, of, of this proposal, uh, anyone would like think about any strength of what is this good for um, before I show the list? Or what do you guys think about this? Is this good? This is bad? This is uh, too, is useless uh, or it has some, I show a bunch of benefits, but do you buy it or not? Uh, what do you guys uh, think about this proposal? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. The paper is from 2013, right? So it took some time to people to to actually think about this. Is there any any other one or any point that you guys think that is good for? So sure. Yes, this is an excellent question, and I actually don't have a good slide here for that. But the, the processing near memory solution, you still operate. Okay, let's go back to this slide here. I can, I think, would be better to see. So, uh, in the let's imagine this is like the organization of a DRAM chip, and the upmem proposal, for example, that we talk about, it's going to add some logic here, right, nearby the bank. Uh, the, the, the bank itself has an interconnect, right? So uh, I didn't explain, or this was uh, more or less in the, in, the, uh, in the background, in the background for DRAM, but you read, like you, when you access a row, you access 4,000 4, elements at once. And, but when you read, you read only, for example, 64 bits or eight bits. And the, this interconnect here is designed for that. So uh, you can, if you want to read that 4,000 uh, elements at once, you need to do at you cannot. You need to do multiple copies of these uh, uh, 4,000 uh, rows. Uh, so my point here is that the bandwidth that your processor near memory solution is going to see is always lower than the bandwidth of processing using memory solutions because independently on what, how, where you place the computation, you are going to see some bottleneck because there is some interconnect that connects the cells or the simplifiers into the chip or into across the banks or across the, to the, from the banks to the memory controller. So the, the other solution that I show from Samsung, right? IXDIM, they put the, 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 the processing memory solution, processing memory solution here in the channel. So compared to the upmem solution, the bandwidth is even is even lower because now, like at least here, if I put nearby the banks, maybe I like this is a share. Maybe I can like activate the four banks at once, and then there is a way of pipelining, and then I can have maybe like at best case four times the bandwidth of a single uh, channel here from the bank. But once I move here to the channel, I only have one connection, so I'm bottlenecked by this by this by this number of pins here now. So the further away you are from the, from the array itself, the lower the bandwidth, the higher the latency, the higher the energy. And this is a really good uh, um, rule of thumb for all of everything that we are talking about over here. And I guess, uh, I guess this is the main difference is, is, is the bandwidth and the latency that you are going to observe. And, and, and of course, energy, right? Because you're moving things across the channels. There is no slide here. I, I, I think we never did this. No, I did at some point. So usually uh, is at least uh, uh, one to two order of magnitude. Uh, uh, this is one to two order of magnitude uh, more efficient than the, the processing near uh, main solution. Uh, again, because of this, this, the bandwidth of this bus here is around that order. Uh, the difference between the bandwidth that you're going to find here inside or the bandwidth that you're going to inside the chip. The interbank, I always talk about the best case. Uh, the interbank uh, probably for the, for across the banks, uh, for the processing your memory solution, 
you're probably going to observe the same thing because the processing your memory solution is going to operate at bank granularity. The across subarrays, across subarrays inside the same bank, the way that it's proposed here is really bad. So probably uh, the processing your memory solutions would provide some benefit over there because we don't need to probably would not have to do this two times pipelining of 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 the data across the, this bus. You can, probably you can do only once. So uh, for inside. So to summarize, sorry, summarize the inside the subarray, uh, inter, uh, inter subarray, uh, the row clone is going to be much more efficient, one to order of magnitude more efficient than cross near memory. Uh, inter, uh, the across different banks, uh, different subarrays in different banks is probably the, pretty, much, pretty much the same, uh, row clone and the, and the cross near memory solution. For across, uh, in, from subarrays, different subarrays inside the same bank, uh, um, the processing memory solution is likely a little bit better than this mechanism over here. Does it answer your question, more or less? Okay, good. Any other question? Sure. That is a really good question, actually. And there are, uh, there is some, uh, there is a paper that I'm going to mention, but I'm not going to get into details here, that is called uh, Figaro. So basically, there. Um, let me. I'm going to advance a little bit here, just for me to uh, explain this. So the subarrays, uh, uh, the, the different subarrays in a bank, they share uh, some interconnect uh, over here. So basically, as I mentioned, right? You read a, 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 a you access for like in this case eight kilobits. So uh, you access eight kilobits, then you read 64 bits. Uh, so basically what this paper is going to tell you is that if you want to move 64 bits of data from one subarray to another, you can just uh, access the row in one subarray, move the 64 bits into this channel, keep the data in that channel, then access the other subarray, and then the data from this chain is going to be copied back to the, the, the data in the other subarray. So now your granularity is not any more eight kilobits, it's any 64 bits. Uh, so that is the uh, minimum that you can move. It's smaller than that becomes complicated because there is uh, uh, no structure inside the DRAM array that would operate at finer granularity. Then, this is not actually true. Um, there is actually some, but I don't want to get into details there because there is like ongoing work for that. Uh, but let's let's say for right now, what is published, the minimum granularity is any 64 piece of data that you want to move from one to the other. You can do following the same the same row clone principle, but now you involve also this bus over here. It does the answer your more or less question. Yeah. Yes. We are going to talk about that as well uh, in, uh, soon. Uh, there are uh, experimental systems uh, that shows that you can do a clone in commodity RAM. So your DRAM in your laptop here uh, by violating timing parameters of DRAM, violating the time that it takes for activate or violating the time that it takes for a refresh, you get this behavior. You can copy data. And uh, usually what they do, they don't uh, test directly in your MacBook, for example, because you cannot violate the time. You don't have control to violate the times there. What they use is uh, FPGA boards where they can uh, uh, implement uh, uh, memory controllers where they have actually control of like the timing parameters. And, and then they can they show that like, yeah, if the off the shelf DRAMs, you can actually implement this behavior. And then since it's a FPJ board, that's another uh, work that actually generalize that and like uh, encapsulates these requests into ISA instructions and give that ISA instruction to uh, like, a, a, I don't remember who was a risk five or a Bloom core, one type of core that is sitting on, uh, on top of that FPJ. So yeah, there is experimental boards and stuff for for that. Hopefully, the answer more or less your question. Okay, so I'm going to continue then. Uh, this is actually all good points. I was asking about strains of row clone, right? So 
Uh, this is what we got when you submit the paper and then the reviewers actually put like a section of weeks and strengths, right? Uh, in your homeworks, you also have to do some a similar thing or think about strengths or weakness of several papers that uh, we are asking you guys to read. So this is what usually, this is what we got when you submit this idea. So it's a, it's a novel mechanism for an important problem, uh, have low, of, uh, low area overheads, it's quite intuitive, uh, even though like when I, when I presented first, I was like asking if you guys understood because at first it seems like really trivial, right? Just send to activate in a pre-charge. So it's really intuitive and easy to implement. And it's a clear, a clear meaning for data internalization, provide a lot of benefits, uh, uh, makes the software designer's life uh, easier. I don't know if I fully agree with that because of you need to modify the application, but at least it makes it cheaper to do that computation. And, uh, and the paper is quite comprehensive and is well written and insightful. Uh, but you also get a bunch of weakness, right, when you submit a paper. Uh, I actually want to ask you guys if you think about limitations of this proposal. I think there was a bunch of questions about granularity, for example, that uh, is what definitely one weakness. Is there any other weakness that you think about when you, when you presented this? You're free to, to bash it. So uh, his, his owner is not here. That is an excellent point. And you really need a really, not, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily complex in the sense of like, it's a lot of logic, but you need as application to have control now of where data is placed inside your DRAM in your system. And you don't have control of that in today's systems. And there are reasons for you to not have control in terms of security, in terms of scalability. So now, for example, if, you're, if you now give control to that to your system, you are open up a security uh, 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 path, right, for you to actually exploit. Uh, so this is definitely one, one limitation. Uh, the, the fact that you, the source role needs to be placed in a particular way, the destination role needs to be placed in a particular way, and Otherwise, your benefit for computation decreases, as you saw, right? If they are placed randomly across different places, your benefits decrease and decrease and decrease further and further because you have to employ other mechanisms. So definitely that's one point. Is there any other point? So I'm just going to show the list then because I'm a little bit over time. Uh, so yeah, the first thing here, uh, data needs to be mapped to the same subarray to have benefits. Uh, uh, does not... It, like they have benefits for data that is moving across inside the subarray, but not necessarily uh, in different uh, DRAM channels, for example. So now in a DRAM chip, you have several channels, right? That you have a DRAM, you place those DRAM DIMMs. So if you have several DRAM DIMMs and you are the one data, one source uh, row is in one DIMM and the other one is in another DIMM, you still have to move the data across the DIMM. So it does not change much. Uh, the inter subarray is very inefficient, as I show, is actually the CPU. Uh, at some point performs better than the inter subarray thing. The one that moves, uh, the data is inside different subarrays inside the same bank. That was the, the worst. Uh, causes a lot of changes in the system stack as uh, was asked here. Like you need to show the, the application now needs to figure out how to map the data and do an end-to-end -end design. Coherence, again, is a problem. I think I briefly talk about this. If what it happens is if you're, there is some stale data in your cache uh, before you're doing this copy, right? You need to write that data back. Uh, this paper here, I didn't talk about this, but this, this evaluation was basically done in simulation and does not consider a multi-chip system, this chip like with uh, several channels, for example. So this is the type of, uh, and also it questions the workload. So this is the type of a question that you usually get when you submit a, this type of paper for these top venue conferences and the reviewers point out and then Hopefully you can address. Some of these questions are better. Some of the questions are better than the others because they actually, a good question should question then the idea itself and detect how technical sounds that, that idea is. So if it works, if it does not work, or if there is a work that I already have proposed this. And uh, all of like the initial questions here are super valid questions. The question about the data mapping, the question about 
the this end-to-end -end system stack that you need to provide support for. They are really valid questions. But if there are other questions that are not so useful, for example, for example, uh, are these the best workloads to evaluate? Like you can always find another workload to evaluate your idea. And oh, uh, this is only done in simulation. So now like we are in academia, right? Uh, I need to manufacture a DRAM chip itself so I can uh, have my idea published. Like it's a bit uh, unreasonable. And this is what uh, we talk about or Arnold talks about, about these red holes, uh, about performance analysis. And this is not only for paper evaluation, like this is, um, this is for any type of, uh, of system evaluation that you have. Uh, in your class or uh, in your in your job where you need to measure performance for uh, application, uh, we can always go a level deeper, but you need to figure out where you should stop. So you can always demiss idea because, oh, this idea didn't evaluate my favorite workload. I don't know, my favorite workload is a, a Minecraft and this idea didn't evaluate it, so reject. Uh, or metrics, oh, I, this idea is really good, evaluate performance, energy, but didn't evaluate reliability or didn't evaluate I don't know, uh, pick your favorite metric, yeah, performance times energy, whatever. Uh, or this, this system is really nice, but it only consider some points uh, in configuration details, uh, but it does not consider, for example, a system where I have, I don't know, uh, 31 Durham Deems connected in a ring that is in, sitting in my base, in the, in my, in a, in the base of my, of my apartment, for example. So you can, you can always complain about all of those points. Does not mean that they are good complaint points because you can always add and there is no stop over here. So you need to figure out uh, what is enough to evaluate the idea, evaluate that uh, consistently, evaluate that well, uh, uh, evaluate the idea first and foremost to see if it makes sense, and then just based on that. So when you are doing your reviews for the uh, homeworks, uh, you're going to do a lot of them. Try to avoid all of those red holes. Try to, uh, if, if indeed, for example, I'm proposing a machine learning system for convolution neural networks, and we are in 2023, and if I only evaluate AlexNet, which was proposed, what, 10 years ago, I'm going to, I, uh, that complaint about the workload might be a valid workload, right? Because maybe that workload is not representative anymore because it's now like there's many advanced, but like uh, how many other neural networks should I evaluate? Should I evaluate, I don't know, the latest uh, uh, la large language model that's been using chat GTP? I'm not, I'm not open AI. I cannot even evaluate that workload myself. That's proprietary, right? So there is a limit. There is a balance that you need to figure out uh, uh, what you should uh, shoot for. So try to avoid all of those uh, red holes when you're doing your paper reviews for the semester. And this also actually from a book, uh, The Art of Computer System Performance Analysis. Uh, have everyone, anyone here read or heard about this book uh, before? Not even Safari members, I'm really sad. Uh, but yes, over there, you can see performance analysis red holes. So that is, you can, you can always miss idea if you talk about workloads, metrics, configurations, or details. And we are going to talk about uh, more later on uh, about on, on this. And so um, before going to a break, I'm going to briefly talk about row clone follow-ups. So uh, some of them I'm going to describe in more details than the others. But uh, the first question here is that, can we do the inter-subarray thing, right? It was really bad. Can we improve that? So yes, there is a work that follow-ups row clone that's called LISA, Low Interconnect Subarray. Data movement, uh, and, and then uh, we, I'm going to show how it's done. So can we uh, enable data movement in smaller granularities? Uh, again, was a question here. Uh, yes, uh, there is this work called Figure that does what I explained with that 64-bit movement across that interconnects, that connects the inter -subarrays. Can you do better inter-bank row copy? So different subarrays across different banks. There is a work that uh, proposed different net interconnect network instead of that bus, so that you can do better uh, interbank uh, row copy. And can we do? Can you use this chart sharing idea that we use for row copy to other solutions to do any other things that row copy? Yes, there we are going to see how we can do um, book bitwise uh, boolean operations and or uh, and not uh, with this work that's called embed. And later on, you're going to generalize that to do addition, multiplication, division, arithmetic operations 
also following the same principles that I described for uh, row call. So briefly before the break, I want to talk about that lizard that uh, is going to mitigate that uh, data movement inside the single, uh, the sub, uh, across the subarrays inside the single bank. So again, this is an uh, overview of DRAM. We have the DRAM cells, subarrays. Uh, here have uh, subarray have five to rows, and uh, in this case here, uh, eight kilobit uh, rows. We have this interconnect that connects the different subarrays, um, but this interconnect is really low bandwidth. Like it's, it, it, again, you want to move eight kilobits of data through this interconnect of 64 bits. You can calculate the number of cycles that's going to take, right? It's just this divided by that, that, that 64 bytes, uh, bits. So this is going to create a bottleneck for processing using DRAM solutions. Uh, so our goal is to provide a different substrate that enables better connectivity across these different subarrays for us to do uh, inter-subarray uh, 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 copies uh, efficiently. So uh, this paper, uh, Lisa proposed uh, uh, to, I'm going to uh, explain it uh, with the figure. Uh, so here we have the two different subarrays in the same uh, DRAM bank. And they, as again, they don't have a connection between them. So the idea is quite simple. We are going to add a connection. So now we are going to, add, we are adding a path between uh, two adjacent subarrays inside the DRAM chip. And now we can just apply row clone as I explained before to copy the data from one subarray to another subarray directly. And this, uh, uh, this uh, path only incurs like 0.8% uh, area chip uh, overhead on top of the DRAM chip. Uh, this provides us with uh, versatility because we can now accelerate more applications. We can do other things like in DRAM caching and fast precharging. Uh, and this uh, is basically, the idea is, Quite straightforward, right? You create the interconnect, and now you don't have the problem anymore. And this paper was uh, in, uh, uh, publishing HPCA, uh, High Performance Computing Conference, 2016. And uh, the other idea that I mentioned that moves the 64 bits across different rows is called Figaro. Uh, it was pro pre uh, presented in Micro uh, Microarchitecture Conference, 2020. And the Network One uh, was is a as a is a um, journal paper, uh, it needs to be fixed. Uh, maybe someone can remind me, it already appears, we already uh, in 2023. And I think this is a good point uh, to give it a break before uh, we get into the other processing using memory architectures. Is there any other question? Uh, so let's do a 13 minutes break. Maybe we can come back in 2.30. Thank you.
Hello, hello.
Good morning. Forgot what I was actually. Ah. So um, let's continue with the processing using memory stuff. Um, so yeah, so for, uh, follow up works on uh, row clone. I think I'm um, going to talk about several of them soon. Uh, we, someone asked about how, if this is done in a real system. I think I briefly talk about how uh, people violate time parameters to implement processing using DRAM. Uh, this is the compute DRAM paper and the PyDRAM paper. Uh, if you can do the same thing in other memory technologies like uh, phase change memory or flash devices, uh, yes. And the Pinatu paper and also uh, Flash Cosmos, which I'm going to talk soon. Uh, if you can do other things other than initialization, yes. You can do, for example, uh, random number generation or uh, um, unclonable functions. Uh, this, this works for more group. And, but you still need efficient solutions for coherence and data reuse, for example. There are some solutions for coherence, but they're not necessarily the, most, the best one. So I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the PyDuram uh, framework. Uh, this one that, I'm, I'm, that I mentioned that uh, not only violates the RAM time parameters to do row copy, but also proposes end-to-end -end FPGA. Really annoying the design. Okay. End-to-end uh, FPGA-based frameworks for um, processing using DRAM. So we have this uh, setup in your group that is called uh, SoftMC that uh, enable us to have a customized memory controller. So once you have this customized memory controller in, a, in a FPGA, we can actually violate these DRAM time parameters to do row, uh, row clone, for example. And uh, uh, this um, uh, PyDuram paper or project from Atabark uh, actually uh, creates like an entire system around that uh, with like, a, I was correct, the risk 5 core. Um, and and to uh, enable like the end-to-end -end, uh, evaluation of processing using DRAM systems in commodity DRAM. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more later on. I just want to briefly mention it here. Uh, so again, some summary and takeaways. Uh, MBT, uh, SIMDR, uh, row clone uh, is a novel me mechanism for data copy initialization. It's really simple uh, and it requires hardware software cooperation, uh, has a, some potential for a lot of future works. And uh, the paper, again, is quite straightforward, I guess. Uh, hopefully, it's, I don't know if it's a required reading. Maybe it is. Uh, at some point, you're going to have to read it for the exam anyway. Uh, so uh, moving on uh, with this mindset of processing using DRAM, now we are going to do a little bit more fancy stuff. So we did row copying, row initialization, uh, some data movement, some reorganization. Uh, now we want to do uh, bulk bitwise operations, Boolean operations, and and or, for example. So how can you do it? So let's say that you want a processing using memory solution that uh, does copy zeroing and or not a majority operations. Uh, we want this to be low cost. Uh, we also want to not include any logic to do these uh, operations. And uh, our mechanism also should provide a really high performance and energy improvement uh, to uh, compared to uh, baseline systems. So this is this micro uh, micro solid evidence paper called Embit, and uh, this is not only I'm going to talk about this implemented in DRAM, but it's not only limited to DRAM; it's also uh, enabling other uh, memory technologies. So uh, the, the principle from this. Uh, 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 embed paper or like doing book bitwise Boolean operations is the same principle from the chart sharing from row clone that I just mentioned. We are going to operate on the same idea. But instead of activating two rows at the same time, now we are going to activate three rows at the same time. So here we have three rows, A, B, C. Uh, a is uh, storing one, B is storing one, C is storing one. So let's see what happens if you activate all of the three rows at the same time. So when these three rows activate at the same time, the, the charge that they have stored is going to uh, perturbate the bit line. It's going to create some bit line disturbance with this delta voltage here. And then the C simplifier is going to be enabled and it's going to then amplify that voltage to the majority of the perturbation. So the majority here, let's go back to the animation. It was, so the majority between these three voltages here is a high voltage, right? So this is, uh, is leading to uh, a higher voltage. 
and the majority of uh, of of uh, and then it's going to be the majority of A, B, and C, uh, which is going to be one actually or VDD. So the vote is going to be perturbated towards VDD, and would be the same if uh, let's say if uh, B, C, and B was discharged and A would be discharged would be again the voltage would be perturbated to the to zero uh, in this case. Uh, so this is what we call a triple row activation because we're activating three rows at the same time and allowing these three rows to perturbate the, the bit line uh, simultaneously instead of them going sequentially one by one. And then if you do the, the, uh, like the calculation, you're going to see that the final state uh, of that the, you're going to see in this simplifier is going to be a uh, and B uh, or B and C uh, uh, or uh, A and C. And if you uh, put uh, simplify this with C, you're going to see that uh, this is either A plus B or A plus, uh, uh, A and sorry A or B or A and B. And uh, if you you can if you can control the computation itself by setting this uh, this the third row C. So if you set C to if you set C to to one, you're going to have A or B. And if you have if you set C to zero, you're going to have A and B. So now we're using the same principle of chart sharing that I just mentioned before. We can not only do copy, but you also can do and and or. So now you extend that or or computation. And again, uh, hopefully that was more or less clear. The basic principle is still the same. It's, letting charge being shared simultaneously uh, for those three activated rows uh, and then letting the simplifier doing this job to amplify the voltage to where the majority of the, uh, the charge that was initially starting the rows are. Is this more or less clear, the principle? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move on then because you're going to build on top of that. So uh, we are going to call this a book and, uh, a book and operation. So you want to you have three, uh, two rows and the output is going to be stored uh, in a third row. This is just some implementation details how this is done. We are going to have some designated rows for this computation because if you look at the image here, once you do the triple row activation, you actually lose the charge. So of, uh, the charges of, uh, of the three initial rows is overwritten. So because all of them, are uh, the, the word lines are of the three rows are still asserted. And this was uh, the, the simplifier is, is going to, or the bit line is going to have the result of that uh, majority operation. And the result is going to be stored in the three rows at the same time. So you lost your data. If, uh, you need to make sure that you have some designated row to uh, copy the data so you don't lose the, if your inputs are raised or something in your program. Uh, and then row clone is going to do this addition operation by copying the date, those data into those designated rows first using row clone, and then doing this triple row activation uh, of the three rows. And then finally, the result is going to be stir, stored in the, into the destination row C. Uh, this paper was firstly proposed in this uh, call paper and later on in the micro. Uh, uh, in the micro version. So now we have uh, copy, initialization, uh, and and or. For us to be uh, uh, complete, uh, complete, or complete, so we can do any Boolean operation, we are missing not. So once you have not, you can do any operation because we have and or, if you have not and end is and and is, and is a logical complete, right? So you can do anything. So how we can do not? So for not, there is not actually uh, is that they, they, it's not like based on this chart sharing. That is actually a trick. So we have been seeing this figure for this simplifier for some slides so far. Um, and I didn't explain it actually what it is. So a simplifier is basically two inverters connected back to back. And, and so you can see here, right? They have one inverter and then they are connected back to back. And then this is connected to the bit line. So when you access one row in your ZRAM chip, in the other side of the C simplifier, you already have the inverted value over there. This is by default. This is not being proposed by Embed. This is how your DRAM chip operates. So you already have this bit line bar here holding the negated value from that the row that was activated. What is missing us is a way of using this bit line bar value here that is storing the other side of the C simplifier. So Embit is going to propose to use this uh, row of dual contact cells. Basically, it's a path between this bit line bar 
into the cell itself. So we have now this N-word line transistors here, and you can see that it's creating a path from the bit line, the other side of the amplifier, the bit line bar, to this excess transistor into the DRAM cell themselves. So now by controlling this N-word line, we can store the data in its original value um, by not asserting it, or the negated value in the other side of the amplifier uh, by asserting the N-word line. So now using DRAM, you have and or not. So now you are Boolean complete, uh, functional complete. Uh, and this is more or less uh, how, how it, uh, it works. Uh, and the embed paper uh, shows like the throughput that you get compared to a CPU, a GPU. Someone asked about uh, a near memory processing uh, system, right? So this HMA, H, HMC system here, you can think of, of it. Did one additional transistor for every uh, for all of the cells in a row. Uh, so yes, so if you have four thousand cells in a row, in a row, you need four thousand transistors for 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 that particular thing. Uh, MBIT is going to only allow or is going to only design some few rows that enables this knot. So instead of like enabling the entire DRAM array to do this uh, not operation, we are going to have only, if I not remember, not recall, uh, if I recall correctly from the paper, it's only two rows. So in the end, it's only, uh, uh, let's say if the row is 4,000, just 8,000 of those transistors. You might think that is a lot, but like in a, in a DRAM array, you have, uh, I don't know, 64,000 transistors over there. So it's actually not that much. Uh, Yes, that would be a lot. And uh, we do, and we, one of our design principles is that we want to have minimal area costs, right? So we don't, we want to just design the bare minimal so we can make use of it. So also, um, so that is, uh, I'm going to do a drill here. There is this problem with DRAM manufacturers. So DRAM is a, is a, is a really uh, um, um, cost, uh, the uh, cost sensitive uh, uh, process for you to manufacture. So DRAM manufacturers, there are only few of them in the world. There are only three big ones, Micro, SK Hynix and Samsung. And they operate at really, really thin margins. Uh, and they get that margin by optimizing the DRAM chip to do uh, storage. So they want to put more and more transistors so you can have more and more capacity so they can sell that DRAM uh, chip to you for more money, basically, it's that, that simple. Once you start doing this, like redesigning a little bit of this, put cell, one cell here, put another cell there, put a row uh, to do this not operation. The array, the, as you saw before, the array is really, the baseline array is really, uh, uh, well structured, right? To do, to do grids, so it's really easy for you to replicate. It's really easy for you to uh, to lay out because everything is like more or less the same uh, shape. Uh, so you can just like uh, remove, you do one single design of the array, replicate many times as needed, compact and ship, and and you get your money. Once you need to do a design for a particular chip, the shape of the array changes, and now it become like one particular chip is also is not actually in the same uh, organization of the other ones, the design of the array is going to change. You're going to increase a little bit of in the cost of the memory itself. Of course, that cost is coming with a lot of performance as I'm showing here, uh, performance benefits that I'm, I'm showing here, right? So it's already a good uh, uh, motivation. But DRAM manufacturers tend to, uh, to only think about that small margin that you are talking about. So that, that design principle that we, put in the, in the beginning saying that we want to do bare minimum modification to the, the RAM to enable a lot of things is really important to motivate the industry to actually go and implement this in their chips or like enable these features in their chips. And later on, I'm going to show the reviews that we get when you submit this type of proposals to conference. And you're going to see that a lot of reviews are going to say, I don't see this being manufactured because the RAM manufacturers are really sensitive to change. Uh, but this is research. We are not industry, so we shouldn't be limited by what three main manufacturers in the world thinks that we should do. Of course, is a business is important. Uh, we should take into considerations. We are doing that here, but we should also think about 
big ideas to fix big problems, right? Otherwise, nothing changes. And so I guess this is a little bit of a derail that I want to say why this is important to only keep few rows uh, with this particular property over here or minimal modifications. So I guess this is like answer more or less your question. Okay. We're going to more on this later on. It's, it's a lot of fun when you get to that part. Uh, so so uh, this is what Emmett is showing uh, uh, in terms of throughput. This is a log scale, as you can see, you get really high throughput compared to a baseline CPU, a GPU. Uh, you can consider this like a proxy and dear memory solution. Uh, and this is Ambit, and this is Ambit using a 3D stack memory. Um, and, and then this is for the operation that you're supporting, not and or, nor, and, and then the mean. And in terms of energy also, we uh, drastically reduce the energy consumption to do these operations inside the DRAM itself, uh, to order of magnitude. Uh, yes, again, it's pretty much the same thing. And now the question is, is this useful? So is uh, bitwise operations used in real applications? So the answer, yes, it's using many applications actually. So in databases in particular, you use a lot of, uh, of uh, bitwise operations to do filtering of queries. And uh, that is Bitfino in web search. Encry encryption algorithm uses a lot of shifting and also uh, bit manipulation. Uh, DNA sequence, we also use a lot of uh, uh, bit zero operation, uh, bit, uh, bitwise operations. So uh, in the Ambit paper, they take one of these uh, uh, applications. In this case, here's a data structure called bitmap index and uh, implement this bitmap, bitmap index uh, operation use Ambit itself. So basically you have several tables and these tables, you are going to apply a filter on top of these tables and this filter can be seen as like either a or, or a not operation. So uh, you're going to, for example, you have a database query that you want to filter for people that age are less than 18 or between 18 and 25 and so on and so forth. So you can do this with uh, uh, or operations or end operations. And uh, uh, as you can see here, if you do that in embeds, you get great performance compared to a baseline CPU system. Uh, this is another application, it's a database application called uh, Bitwaving. Uh, again, you have a query here that you are counting some particular, uh, some particular fields. And again, if you can see that the, the, the speed up that Ambit offers on top of the CPU is really large. Uh, this is, there are a lot of homework. I, I don't know if you guys already saw, did homework one. And I guess there are a bunch of questions related to, to this in the, in the homework one uh, with like this bit waving and bit mapping this for Ambit. So yeah, so this is the uh, Ambit paper. Uh, is there any question related to that on how this is being done? and then or not so okay that's great and uh, now we are going to generalize this so okay now we can do copy we can do and we can do or we can do not if you do or and not we do nand nor xor so all of those are possible so what about addition uh what about uh multiplication can you also do it uh, so you're going to uh, allow this generalization to any other complex operation using the same primitive that Ambit proposed. And this is uh, a paper uh, that is part of my uh, PhD and it was published in ASPROS uh, 2021 called SIMDRAM. So this key idea of these papers is what's called SIMDRAM. Is the SIMD name here is because we are going to now see those columns of cells inside the DRAM array as SIMD lanes in a SIMD uh, processor. Like a, uh, and they are all going to operate in parallel to do arithmetic operations. Uh, and this paper is proposing not only how to compose operations, but also providing the end-to-end -end, uh, support so you can do that in a system. So now you're going to enable complex and arbitrary operations in DRAM in a SIMD fashion. Um, so the SIMD DRAM work uh, builds on top of two main ideas. Uh, the first idea is that uh, we are going to lay out data in a vertical data layout. So in your regular system, uh, you, you can look at this figure here, like the other around the like uh, each like this blue row here is, is is this blue column in your system is a is a row actually, like uh, instead of being an, a, a column. So data is is is, is laid out in DRAM in a row major way. So if you lay out data in a row major way and you want to do uh, addition, for example, 
uh, you guys can see a problem or why you cannot just do it? Uh, is there any is there any intuition why? So who else here? Like we can do and or not, right? So probably you guys are familiar with the I don't know a rib carry adder circuit. Is, does anyone have remember how that is implemented? It's basically uh, a bunch of ors and a bunch of xors, and then you compute the the sum and also you compute the query, right? And if you want to to uh, end bit operation, if you want to just uh, compose, you replicate this particular circuit n times, right? And but then you have to propagate the query from the one block of the circuit to the other block of the circuit. If you are doing this in Duram, in Ambit, as was described, in the data is in horizontal data layout, uh, we have a query from one element stored in one column here, and, and you need to propagate to another element in another column. So you need to propagate one data from this column to this column. Um, actually, it would be the other one, this column to this column. But in, uh, in Duram, you don't have that interconnection. So there is nothing here that connects different columns, right? So if you just want to go there to Duram and implement, uh, let's say, Ambit does N and R, you are going to implement addition using a rip carry adder, uh, you're not going to be able to propagate the query. So you're not going to be able to do the, the addition. So in the end, the operation that you're going to be, uh, be able to implement is going to be limited to any operation that does not require this uh, data propagation across different iterations of algorithm. So this is why actually we are uh, using this vertical data layout. Now your elements are all laid out in a vertical way. And if you want to propagate, and then each, uh, each, L, each column here is going to be uh, different bits of, uh, uh, of a, particular, a particular data structure. So think about, uh, uh, just look at one particular column. Let's say that you have a four bit uh, uh, integer in your system. Uh, you are going to place bit one in, uh, in this uh, blue cell here, bit two in this one, bit three in this one, uh, bit zero, actually I should have started at zero. So zero, one, two, three. And then if you have another integer, you're going to put it in, in another column and then another integer, another integer. And if you now have, want to do uh, addition of two integers, you're going to stack them vertically. And, and for you to propagate the query from one uh, iteration of the rip carry adder to another, uh, they, all of the elements are placed in the same column. So you, and they share the same column, right? So now you can simply uh, use row clone to, to move the data inside the column and propagate that query, uh, that, that carry, sorry, for that particular uh, adder operation. So this is the uh, why we are using this vertical data layout here uh, to for 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 sim Duram because now you can do implicit shifting operations. So shifting now means just row clones for different row indexes here, and uh, you can also have different a lot of parallelism because every single column now becomes a different, for example, integer in your application. So if you, you can have an array of uh, let's say. 8,000 integers, all of them operating in parallel doing addition, for example. And another thing that you're going to do is that you are not going to use uh, the, sorry, the and and or and not operations that Ambit proposed for computation. Um, because when I show the triple row activation in Ambit, what was actually being performed was a majority between the three uh, rows that was being simultaneously activated, right? Uh, and by using majority-based computation instead of using and and or based computation, we can optimize uh, a lot of the logic. So for example, uh, if I want to implement the carry out or the, the, the carry propagation in a repro carry adder, if you use and and or, you're going to have to use, you're going to have this uh, equation here. So each portion of this equation means a triple activation. So in this first part here, one, two, three, four, five. So you have to do five triple row activations at least. Actually, it should be six. I don't know why it's missing one. But anyway, um, but uh, instead of using and and or, if I use uh, uh, a majority gate, basically the same computation can be done with a single triple row activation because the triple row activation is already a majority operation from default. So you, you're going to operate in that particular logic to op optimize the latency of processing using Duram computation. So this provides us higher performance and higher throughput. So based on that, you propose this three-step uh, framework uh, in the paper. Uh, so the first step, you are going to, so it takes as input like some operation that you want to implement. 
for example, addition, and then it is going to transform that operation into its majority representation. Then in the second step, you're going to take this majority representation of your operation, and we are going to generate the sequence of triple row activation, row clone, row clone and uh, operations, and triple row activations, activating pre-charts, uh, to implement that operation in DRAM. Then in the end, when the application issued that particular uh, operation, like uh, pro, uh, in DRAM addition, uh, we have some control units inside the memory controller to uh, orchestrate the computation independently from the, from the, transparently from the programmer. And I'm going to go through the steps over here with some uh, uh, detail. So the first step here is to convert your uh, desired operation into an efficient majority maze operation. And this can be, if you start from an end and or implementation of your operation, this can be done quite naively. So for example, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, also related to the uh, embed part that I just presented. So if you have an end gate, for example, this end gate is equivalent to a majority gate, uh, uh, but you set one of the uh, input of this majority gate to uh, zero. So if you can also do a, if you want to have an OR gate, this OR gate is equivalent to a majority gate where one of the inputs is one. So if you have as a, a repo, this is a repo carry adder that I just mentioned before. So if you have this repo carry adder here uh, with uh, and and or only cir uh, circuits, this is actually just the carry propagation logic for that repo carry adder. But anyway, if you want to uh, do this implementation, uh, you can simply uh, uh, translate each one of those uh, uh, gates and and or gates into majority gates and setting up the inputs accordingly. But if you do this, you're going to have, have high latency compared to the optimal solution. Because again, each one of those bubbles here is a sequence of activation and precharge commands, which include uh, that it adds up to the overall latency of the operation. So instead, we are going to optimize uh, we have this grid optimization algorithm that's going to go through this graph here with these uh, nodes with, and, and it's going to apply some transformations similar to when you study Boolean logic, when you do like the Morgan and like uh, circuit simplification. It's pretty similar to that, but for design specifically for majority logic. So you're going to do that. And then in the end, we are going to come up with a more optimized version of the initial circuit. Um, this is going to reduce overall latency. So the second step is translating that particular circuit that was generated, that majority-based circuit, into sequence of DRAM row activations and DRAM uh, uh, row copies and triple row activations. And we are going to call the sequence of operations a microprogram. Uh, so our goal here then is to generate this microprogram that can implement the desired operations in DRAM. So there are two steps over here. The first step is to allocate the DRAM rows to do the computation. And the second step is the proper generation of the microprogram. So let's start with the first step. So uh, this here is a, a sub organization that was proposed by uh, the Emmet paper. As I showed, uh, as I briefly mentioned before, uh, we are going to have some specialized rows that are going to be designed, they are going to be, uh, um, I, this this box here is not aligned, and I just saw it, and I cannot unsee it. And so the we are going to have some designated rows to do the triple row activations, uh, because when you if you if you do it in the regular DRAM rows, you are going to destruct the data, and you don't want to do that. Uh, also, we are going to have this special uh, row decoder here. We didn't talk about row decoders before, but when you issue a DRAM address, so you issue like you I want to add, access the first row. And then you issue like row address one. That is a row decoder that connects the word lines of the Duram cell of the Duram array, and assert, asserts that appropriate row uh, number that you want. Uh, we are going to have a, a specialized uh, row decoder in the design that, with a single address, we are going to activate three rows at the same time. So it's, it's the same as the one before, but the one before was mapping one to one, and this is going to map one to three. So instead of this, uh, basically save us some cycles of sending triple row activations like one after the other. You're just going to send one uh, activation with one address that actually means three rows. And then you're going to, and this row decoder is going to activate those three rows at the same time. 
And also we have some specialized roles with uh, all ones or all zeros to do uh, and and or operations. Uh, those are called uh, constant roles uh, because it's initialized with ones and zeros. So this is the overall organization uh, of, of, of that we are working on from Pryu, which is Embed. So this is limits us what we can do because the, we have some constraints. So we only have some uh, limit number of rules that are designated for computation. Again, this comes back from that problem that I was talking before that we cannot just like completely change the DRAM array because uh, of the cost. So you're going to limit ourselves to some few rules for computation. And the second one is the destructive behavior. When you do a triple row activation of three rows, the data, uh, the output of the triple row activation is going to be stored in the three rows themselves, and you are going to lose the initial data that was stored there. So this is also needs to be taken into consideration. So what we are going to do, we are going to have this allocation algorithm that's going to take the inputs of, the, of that graph that was generated and map it to those uh, designated roles, that few designated roles that we have in the in the subarray. The location algorithm is quite straightforward. You go input by input of a majority gate, and we allocate them to free rows, so assign as many inputs as the number of free compute rows available. And we are going to use the property that the since the the all of the three rows are going to have the same output in the end of the computation, we can reuse the result for uh, the next. A computation that's going to be performed. So we can, like, if you need to use the carry out, for example, we have three options of carry out for the next ne next sequence of triple activations that you need to do. Uh, this is a really uh, 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 simplified version of the algorithm. There are other steps, but it's, it's more or less this. And then once you have that uh, implementation as well, you need to start generating uh, row clone and triple activation commands. And this is exactly what is being done here. So uh, it's again, it's quite straightforward. Just go through the inputs that of the, that gate. And then if you need, we start by issuing copy operations from the data that is, is stored in a data uh, in that uh, initial address to the desig designated row. So all of these activate and activate pre-charge are row clone comments that I mentioned before, copy operations. Then we issue a triple row activation, implementing the majority computation here. And then we, we issue another row clone operation to copy the data back to this output array. And then you're going to have this initial sequence of operations that does the NDRAM computation called microprogram. And uh, we are going to optimize it by uh, coalescing some row copies into a single ones and also merging some majority and row activations. And this, in the end, come, uh, by doing that, we can reduce the number of operations uh, in the micro program itself. So, and then by repeating this micro program several times, n times, you can implement n bit operations. So now uh, this uh, provides us uh, with uh, some extra flexibility. So if you want to implement, if you have to, two arrays with integers and those integers are 32 bits, uh, uh, you just need to repeat this sequence of DRAM uh, operations 32 times and you're going to have a 32 bit addition in the end. But if you have a four bit addition, you don't need to repeat this 32 times. You just repeat it uh, four times and then you're going to have your four bit addition and so on and so forth. Uh, this is what uh, is this is what um, it's called a bit serial computing because you are uh, uh, going bit by bit doing the computation. In the end, you're going to have the the final output, uh, and this is it, the final microprogram. This is going to be stored in DRAM for future use, and you're going to have a new instruction called BBO obstruction that's going to be added to the CPU ISA to index this particular uh, microprogram. So the last step is this uh, to execute this microprogram in DRAM. And then we have this control unit placed in the memory controller that actually receives this baby up instruction, translates it into to the appropriate microprogram, and also issues the DRAM comments to the DRAM chip itself. The design over there. Uh, uh, in this paper as well, we talk about a, a bunch of uh, system integration uh, uh, aspects of, of, of processing using DRAM. And uh, I'm going to briefly talk about one of them here, which is transposing data. As I said in the beginning, we are assuming uh, in, the, in this paper or in this work that the data for doing processing using DRAM is going to be layout uh, vertically inside the DRAM array itself, even though your, your system layouts data in a horizontal um, uh, manner. So we need to have some hardware over there uh, to convert from one, one format to another. So we have this design 
these transposition units that sits between the LS level cache and the memory controller and basically transpose the data from horizontal to vertical or vertical to horizontally efficiently. Um, it also, it has low impact on uh, performance and also low area costs. And there are many more things uh, in the paper. Uh, we evaluate this in simulation compared to uh, baseline CPU, GPU, and, and Ambit itself. And we evaluate several configurations. Uh, we have 16 uh, operations that we implement uh, in the paper, addition, multiplication, division, uh, some machine learning operations like ReLU, for example. And uh, seven, uh, and we use these operations to accelerate seven uh, real workloads, some database workloads, machine learning, graphics, and neural networks. Uh, we show great performance improvements compared to the CPU system, also to the GPU system, depending on the number of banks that you have, and also compared to Ambit itself. And also have really great energy savings or energy efficiency compared to both CPU, GPU, and Ambit. Uh, this is the, some results for the real applications. You have like two order of magnitude improvements compared to CPU, uh, two order of magnitude compared to GPU, and uh, two orders of magnitude compared to Emits as well. Uh, so uh, the con to conclude, so now we went from uh, initially doing row copy, row initialization, to do and and or and not, to now doing any arithmetic operation that you want. So you can do addition, subtraction, all based on this concept of uh, chart sharing or entry port activation. Know that in any moment, I include any logic to do this operation inside the DRAM chip itself. All of this was performed only based on the principles where DRAM operates. Um, uh, we provide some system integration support in this paper. And uh, yeah, there is a bunch of things there over there uh, in the paper, including program interface and security implications of many other things. And there is a, a lecture of this that is like one hour super long. And, and then there is a bunch of follow-ups. Uh, so this paper was published in 2021, we were in 2023, and I didn't graduate yet. So we need to have follow-ups. And so I can have a thesis. And, and basically we are addressing several aspects. There is still several problems uh, of this process using DRAM uh, solution. Uh, one of them is still the granularity that was mentioned before for copy. This is still is a problematic for uh, uh, processing using DRAM, like sim DRAM, because now the, the granularity of your computation is at least 4,000 or six or 8,000 elements, or even more, because now each uh, uh, column is a different, um, is a different um, element and you have around 65,000 columns accessed simultaneously when you are doing this type of computation in DRAM. So you need to have a particular application with array that is as large as 65,000 elements to do addition. So how often you do addition over 65,000 elements? So yeah, maybe it depends, yes, from some applications does that, but it's not all of applications. And these are really rigid granularities, always 65,000. So you cannot vary that. So this is one problem, for example. Uh, also, this data layout conversion from horizontal to, tra or to vertical is, is somehow problematic because you need to keep moving data from one format to the other. Uh, bit serial operations are quite high latency because if we have an adder and it's bit parallel, you just do it some sequence of operations. But you, if you have to, if you have, for example, if you're doing a, a long, long uh, uh, addition, which is like 128 bits, uh, you have to repeat that sequence of operations 128 times. Uh, and at, uh, every single operation is an access to DRAM, which is by default high latency. So in the end, the latency uh, for this can go really high. Uh, this is why in the results, I went really briefly to it, but you don't know so if you saw, we actually provide low performance compared to a GPU because, uh, uh, or throughput for CPU, uh, the latency for these bit zero operations uh, is really uh, high, even uh, considering the data movement problem that the GPU is, for, is, 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 is um, having. So we need to have to put more and more computing power uh, so we can increase or increase our throughput so that we can uh, um, hide that latency and outperform the GPU. Uh, so yeah, so we, uh, this is a, a problem. Also programming becomes a problem because you need to express 
all of these problems that we talk about before related to having data uh, placed in a particular place in the DRAM and also aligned uh, in, a, in a particular subarray, all of this becomes even more problematic now because now it's not only one row, right? You have one row plus the number of rows that is your uh, size of your elements. If it's a 32, uh, if you is a 32 addition, have 32 rows for one element, 32 rows for another element, and 32 rows for the output. So this alignment and allocation becomes even more problematic. And so yeah, we are working on this uh, process use memory substrate uh, one step at a time. Uh, hopefully one step at a time until I graduate and then uh, you guys can work on this uh, uh, for uh, your master's thesis or future PhDs. Uh, so yeah, so is there any question related to the syndrome paper? Emmett's uh, paper. It's just generalizing. So it's a generalization. So you can think about, so Ambit, Ambit row clone, you can think about them as the building blocks for everything that I mentioned after that, including sim -Duram. So they, this is why I put here one step of, of a time. I joke in the end, but it's actually like one, you do, you show that you can do copy, then later on you show that you can do and and or, then later on you show that you can do addition. And then now you want to do more and more building one, 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 one step of the time. But yeah, it's just a generalization of the ambit rule. Any other question? Okay. Uh, so briefly mentioning, so we can do and or not uh, majority, bunch of arithmetic operations and following up on this concept of chart sharing and triple activation and so on and so forth, we can also do uh, these unclonable functions in DRAM, as this paper, I'm not going to uh, talk about it here, but uh, it's another operation that you can do following the same process. Also, uh, two, random, uh, two, uh, number, two random number generation, uh, uh, also you can do inside DRAM following the same uh, process. Um, and then you can do it in higher throughput and also can generalize it to with a end-to-end system, uh, end -end system support. Uh, so uh, now we I'm going to talk about yet another way of doing uh, operations. So we can do, uh, okay, we can do arithmetic operations and or not. Uh, copy, do you guys feel like you are missing some particular type of operation over here? Multiplication we can also do because you can compose multiplication with addition. So you can just like do that, like you know, in the back, in the paper when you do multiplication, like when yeah, like in elementary school, you can do the same, like the add goes one element one time, shift, blah blah. You can do the same, you, and you do it here. So you can compose multiplication. Bit shifting you can if the data is transposed uh, vertically is basically uh, copying from one row to another because the bits are spread across different uh, rows. So you can do it. Oh, another, is, is, is maybe, is, 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 I don't know if it's an easy guess actually. So if you wanna do a sign, how do I do it? Or cosine or logarithmic. Can I compose a sign by doing arithmetic operations? I can approximate using Taylor series, but I can I actually do it? I cannot. Uh, so we are missing transcendental functions. Those are, is the name of that particular type of uh, operations. A sign, cosine, logarithm, exponential. Uh, uh, am I missing anything? Yeah, I think most, most of those type of functions. So uh, we are going to further expand on this process using DRAM solutions uh, with Pluto right now to support this transcendation functions in DRAM. Uh, so uh, again, this is just what I just mentioned here before. Uh, data movement, we are going to do, uh, we are going to use Ambits to do it. Uh, bitwise operations, no, sorry, row clone. Bitwise operations are going to use Ambits, bit shifting. You can also use Ambit or other type of solutions which I didn't mention here. Arithmetic operations, we are going to use SIMDRAM, but still we are, there is a, this is a limited range of operations. 
Uh, and the goal of this uh, work here is to further push the boundaries, so further enable more and more operations in DRAM uh, at low cost. So what is the key idea of to enable further operations here? So if you want to do operations in your baseline uh, or in your system, well, how you is done, right? You have like an input, an output, and you have some uh, uh, arithmetic units that is going to take the input, transform it into the output, right? By doing computation. But another way of doing computation is by what we call, um, by using lookup tables. So instead of actually perform the computation bit by bit, I'm going to I am going to have a pre-processing step where I'm going to store uh, the uh, pre-computed value somehow in a table. Then I'm going to store this table in my in, in a fast memory. And when I have a new computation, instead of rege regenerating using some arithmetic operations, I'm just going to consume that table. I'm going to check the table and I'm going to get the output of the computation. So this is what is called uh, lookup tables. Uh, it's, it's not new, it's quite old. Uh, many systems uh, use that. FPGAs basically are a connection of these lookup tables uh, connected in a particular way that enables uh, different computations. So it's, it's a quite well known alternative to do uh, traditional operations. Um, so we are going to use uh, these lookup tables to do computation for this transcendental function in DRAM as well, uh, instead of trying to do the computations themselves. So let's see how this uh, is going to work. Uh, so this is the setup, let's say, uh, this, uh, that I, I, I want to do a computation that returns me the second, first, second, and fourth prime numbers. Now, so I have a sequence of prime numbers and I want the first second. So I want to get one, I want to get zero, I want to get one, and I want to get three. Uh, this is, a, is what I want from output. Oh, I'm wrong actually. It's three, two, three, and seven. I always look at the index. So I'm going to have a pre-processing -pre step uh, uh, that is going to calculate these prime numbers. And I'm going to store that in this lookup table uh, in my DRAM array itself. And now when I want uh, this query of, of, of numbers, I'm just going to consume this table and return to the user. So how this uh, is mapped to DRAM, uh, we have some structure. So we have what is called this input vector that's going to in the, uh, store the indexes to that I want from this query from the lookup table. So in this case here, if I want the second prime number here, uh, I want to uh, check the index one of my lookup table. If I have the first prime, if I want the first prime number, I want to index the address zero. If I want the, the fourth prime number, I want to index element three. I'm going to have an output vector as well, and I have my DRAM array. And I'm going to store several, I am also going to have some matching logic between the row that I'm, the row that I'm currently accessing and the, the input vector. And I'm going to store several copies of my table inside the DRAM array itself. So I can have really uh, a high throughput for this uh, lookup table operation. So the main components of, uh, of, of Pluto is what we call this real row sweep operation. So I'm going to send the DRAM comment that is going to uh, sequentially activate each single row uh, of this uh, DRAM array uh, itself. And at each activation, I'm going to compare that row that is being currently being accessed, so the row index, with the indexes of the input uh, vector array itself. And if I have a match between the row index and the input vector, I'm going to allow the data that is being from the row that is being currently accessed here in the row buffer to be copied to my output vector. So I'm going to walk through this example and hopefully it's going to be more uh, understandable. So let's start. So I issue this Pluto row sweep operation. My first row is access. So when the first row is access, uh, the data is copied from the row to the row buffer as before. And now I'm going to start checking the elements of that is our store in the input vector together in, with the row uh, index that is being currently being accessed. So uh, am I accessing the first row right now? No, I'm accessing the rows, uh, the is a bit confused because zero is actually the first and uh, one is the second. So am I accessing the second row right now? No, I'm accessing the first one. Mm -hmm. And so is uh, zero equals to one? No. So I don't, I ex I don't uh, assert that, uh, that transistor that connects the row buffer to the output vector. So it's not a match. 
then I move to the next one. Am I accessing the first uh, row right now, row index zero right now? Yes. So I'm going to, this is a match, and I'm going to access, I'm going to uh, enable the transistor that connects this second element, uh, second position, sorry, of my row buffer to my output vector. So now, uh, here if you look, uh, the, I was looking for the first uh, prime number. The first prime number is, in, is stored in the index zero of my lookup table. Uh, and the look and, and here uh, index zero and this prime number uh, value is two and now I, I I collected the two which is the proper sec uh, first prime number that I'm looking for. This process repeats for each one of the elements uh, of the input vector. So I go to the next elements. Am I accessing the uh, the second prime number or index one? No, it's not a match. And then also for the last one, no, it's not a match. And then uh, it moves to uh, the row sweep operation moves to the next uh, index, row index one. It repeats the same thing. The row is copy. I check one element at a time for matches, copy the data from the row buffer to the output vector. Again, next row, element two, there is no match. And then there is no copies as well. And then lastly, there is like the last row and, uh, the, the last element is going to be a match. And then in the end, I have my output vector uh, with the data. So uh, with this procedure here now, I can also implement a sign function, for example, right? So I can have a, a, a table that stores sign numbers and their outputs, like find a sign of, I don't know, P over two, P over three, blah, blah. and then the, the numbers here, and each one of them are going to be stored here in my DRAM array. And if I want to, I have a list of signs that I'm looking for in an application, I can just index the DRAM array uh, with this particular array here, uh, use lookup tables, and get now my, my, my sign numbers uh, from the DRAM itself. Uh, this extends to other functions. Uh, you can just think about any computation that you can, uh, that you can um, uh, memorize, or you can save in a table. And then this can be uh, uh, operated in, by, in the RAM itself uh, for you. Uh, so in the paper, we designed three different implementations of this Pluto architecture. And uh, the main difference is how this match logic here is actually implemented. So we have one design that uh, implements this match logic using some uh, flip-flops. The other one implements using the cell itself. And the other one is going to implement the uh, cells with some extra uh, uh, access transistor. And these three designs, uh, they are not particularly important. What's important is that they cover different trade-offs in the trade-off space. So each one of the designs have different uh, performance, energy efficiency, area efficiency, and energy efficiency. The first design, um, the one that I mentioned in the figure that I was showing the step-by-step, -step, is what we call buffer simplifier. And it has moderate performance, moderate energy efficiency, and energy efficiency. The second design, which uses the cells themselves, uh, uh, you have a high, low, lower performance, but higher energy efficiency and moderate energy efficiency. And the latest one has higher performance, but high in, uh, uh, low area efficiency and high energy efficiency. Uh, we also talk about the paper some, about some system integration to use this. We have some compiler that calls some APIs and translate this to uh, ISA instructions and a controller that then issues activate and precharge to uh, realize this Pluto lookup table operation. And uh, in the paper, we can further explain uh, uh, how this is done uh, with this really beautiful figure that I draw myself. Uh, so we evaluate Pluto. Uh, with seven real-world applications, and this is average performance here compared to CPU, GPU, and a processor near memory solution. And you can see that this significantly improved performance on top of all of the three architectures. Uh, this is area normalized values. Uh, so you do this because uh, each one of those uh, architectures and systems have different areas, so you want to be fair in terms of like, if you put more air in a system, probably you would have higher performance. So this is a way of like accounting for that. So again, you can see that you also increase that particular metric. And also again, this is a, a pin system. So also uh, energy is really a, a concern. So you significantly improve uh, energy uh, compared to a CPU and a GPU. And this is more, a lot of more things in the paper that this talk that I gave. 
And is there any question related to Pluto? It needs to be pre-computed. So that is a, what is hidden here is that there is a, a latency of initially loading that table into the DRAM itself. And there is a trade-off between the number of times that that uh, table is reused and the benefits that you get from this type of operations. So the more time that that is reused, the, that, that initial latency is on more ties and you get more performance benefits, right? So there's this type of trade-offs. Okay. Any other questions? You need to go to the entire lookup table because again, it's a granularity problem. Uh, so you're going to have to like you, you, there's no way for you to tell that like, oh, my array is only going to have like, I don't have 65,000 uh, uh, signs that I want to look. I just have 1,000. So when you get to 1,000, you should stop. There is no way for you to actually propagate that information uh, to the DRAM chip itself, right? Because you have to have some control for that. So, uh, in the end, uh, the row sweep is going to sweep through all of the rows. That is an excellent question. That is a really a good exam question as well. Yes, then this is actually what we get. Uh, we, we got uh, as a concern from the reviewers of several times that submit this paper. This is really efficient if you are the, the size of your lookup table is small or like the with or the number of elements that you store in your lookup table is relative is more and fits inside the DRAM array. There is a point where uh, that lookup table size is starts to increase and then it's more beneficial if you just do the computation in your CPU. So there is this type of uh, trade-off as well with the size of the lookup table and the performance that you get. And this is significant. This is a, a proposal that shines when that size of the lookup table is like, uh, is the, is, is, is like a smallish uh, of, of the, the width of the computation is relatively small. So yeah, it's definitely the case. Any other question? Okay, that's good. Uh, if we should take a, I'm going to try to finish up everything. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. So I'm not going to take a break. Uh, uh, let, let's see, uh, have just 30 more minutes. Uh, I think I briefly talk about this uh, processing using DRAM solutions uh, using off-the-shelf DRAMs. Uh, there was this question, right? So, was can I do all of these that I mentioned uh, using or in a commercialized DRAM chips? And this compute DRAM chip actually uh, shows that by violating DRAM time parameters, you you can do uh, some of those operations that I just mentioned here. You cannot do all of them yet. Uh, but you can do, for example, row clone, or you can do some integrate some iteration of addition, for example. And I'm not going to get into details how this works. I'm going to briefly mention it. So basically, uh, again, you didn't have a lecture about Jira memory latency yet. This is going to become uh, soon. But basically, when you issue a Jira comment, when you have issue activation, on your issue a precharge, your memory controller needs to respect some particular time that is set by the memory by the memory DRAM manufacturer so that the operation in DRAM uh, performs real, reliably. So you need to give some time to the sense amplifier to sense the data uh, to a particular voltage level, and then the data can be reliable read from the DRAM chip itself, and the reading itself incurs some latency. So there is a bunch, it's a, it's a time, it's a, it's a game of, of, of latency numbers. So what this paper is doing is that you are not going to respect those latency numbers. You are going to violate them. And by violating these, you are going to instigate DRAM to do some weird, some not weird, but to do some behavior that is not in the specification. So in this case here, for example, they, they come up with a sequence of operations, activate, precharge, activate. And uh, so in between the sec, the first activate and the sec, the first activate and the precharge, you're going to respect more or less the time uh, to prop to so the the charge share between the cell and the, the and the row itself happens, as I mentioned before. But between the precharge and the activate, I'm not going to fully respect this precharge time. I'm going to issue activate comments to the next row uh, a bit before the precharge finishes. And this actually what is doing is that my this the 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 voltage level in the bit line. Uh, does not have enough time to be restored to the reference BDD over two uh, voltage uh, 
level. And in the end, you're going to still have some, uh, some um, voltage level that was uh, referenced to the initial activation of the first row. Uh, and then in the end, what is happening is, again, this charge sharing uh, thing that I mentioned before for the row, uh, row clone thing. Uh, you have extra latency, extra voltage uh, or extra charge stored in the, in the, in the bit line cell. And this, this is going to contribute to the perturbation of the next row that's being activated. And then basically you're copying the data between these two, there's two different rows that are uh, being activated uh, for this operation. Uh, yeah, so this is the, what I just mentioned. Um, yeah, the bit line is above uh, the reference and when the second row is activated, which enables the row copy. And a similar thing happens to the, but for you to do addition, you issue a similar sequence of operations, activate, pre-charge, activate, but now you set different uh, time delays between the activate. So T1 to T2 is equals to zero. And basically depending on the address that you use for the rows that you access, you can, you can implement a uh, end operation between those rows. Uh, yeah, so again, uh, uh, the, the time between T1 and T2 is going to be really small. So the CCP fires are not yet activated. And, and the precharge command is not going to be able to close the row before error one. And then you have a uh, addition. So this was tested in IFPGA with several DRAM chips uh, with this infrastructure that I mentioned before, uh, SoftMC, they test 32 DDR3 models, 256 DRAM chips, and they saw that they, uh, yeah, they run some SoftMC experiments by varying these T1 and T2 times. And then this is just a diagram that shows how reliable you can do and or uh, nothing happens, row copy, row copy, uh, with 80% of the row, row copy of 100% of the rows, row copy of all of the rows. So it's not a reliable operation 100% of the time, it requires a lot of testing for you to figure out uh, this time difference and like the behavior that you get from the DRAM chip. But recall that we are using DRAM in a way that the DRAM vendors didn't specify. And we are figuring out that actually we can implement this uh, and new functionalities at no cost because now, are, now I'm not modifying the DRAM chip at all. I'm just buying it and doing this test and figure out that out of the blue, I can do copy or end and or. There is that for temporary control because like the, let me go back. I think you are mentioned here, right? It's more, it's because all of this behavior because everything is based on charge all of these behaviors of uh, change as well, depending on the temperature of the chip. Uh, so depending if the chip, like how much you, you heat or not, um, you can do it more reliable or less reliable. And also there is a component of the, of the aging. So usually if you want to study aging, you actually heat up the chip. So it, does, it, 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 um, it is, is a way of modeling uh, aging for the DRAM chip itself. So that, that is like, is, is, is more in this particular paper is more for control rather to see the, 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 the how temperature changes uh, this particular computing capabilities of the DRAM chip. But in other lectures for other things related to reliability, you're going to see that actually changing this temperature here can have some variation on the expected behavior of the, of the, of the DRAM chip itself. Uh, so I, I kept it more or less high level because you're going to see more or less more on this later, uh, but hopefully it answer more or less. Good question. I don't know if we have a study that directly shows that. Probably yes, but really mild, I guess. Uh, the, the, this guy, this DRAM and operates at really like small, like the, the voltage and circuit like levels. And so it's, I don't think it's, it's enough to actually significantly increase the temperature of the DRAM chip. So uh, like, I don't know, a GPU, for example. Uh, yeah, but uh, there is no work as far as I know that directly shows that correlation. Any other question? Okay, great. Uh, so this is the compute DRAM paper. Uh, then this other uh, solution, the PyDRAM builds on top of it by pro uh, giving a end-to-end -end FPGA based implementation that has like uh, software libraries to do uh, uh, row copy or, or some custom operation and uh, is uh, overall system, uh, programmability. Again, it's based on this 
Uh, I think I showed this figure several times, FPGA board with the pin DIN that you're going to test at this risk five core. And that is like user application is going to interface with uh, system calls so that you can encapsulate processing using DRAM operations and do that uh, using the, your uh, commodity DRAM chip over here. Yeah, there is, uh, uh, this is open source in our GitHub repository. And we show again that all of this is done with a real DRAM chip. It's really important to show that, to say that. And you can do initialization without modifications of the DRAM chip themselves. And then you can do initialization row copy uh, successfully providing high, really high throughput compared to a baseline system. Again, it's uh, open source and you can see your paper. Uh, Atterberg gave a talk uh, at one of our lectures uh, it's, it's online. And then I guess this is mostly uh, what I wanna talk about for processing using memory for DRAM. Is there any other question related to this infrastructure support that we put up? Okay, great. So uh, this, all of this processing using memory that I keep talking about, I talk about a lot about doing that in DRAM, but processing using memory is not limited to DRAM. Uh, other memory uh, technologies can also do similar things. For example, uh, this paper here shows how you do book bitwise operations using emerging uh, non-volatile memory devices, uh, RERAM or phase change memory device. I'm not going to go into details about this one, but I'm going to explain how you can do that using flash, like your SSD uh, device itself. Uh, so really briefly, we're going to have a lecture on this, if I'm not mistaken. No, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So again, you need to have some background on how a, drum, a flash cell uh, works. So a flash cell stores data, again, by varying the amount of charge that you have in the cell. Uh, um, and then they have two modes. So a erased cell or a programmed cell. So a erased cell uh, is going to store low charge, a lower charge level, and a, a programmed cell is going to store a high charge level. And doing activation, the uh, erased cell is going to operate as a resistor while the programmed cell is going to operate as an open switch like uh, the basics of a, a flash cell. As a flash device itself is organized, uh, organized DRAM's uh, flash cells in a NAND string. And so several main flash connected through together to a, uh, uh, a share bit line is called a, a NAND cell, a NAND string, sorry. And several NAND strings connected together to word lines is called a NAND block. So again, this is just a background on how a flash cell operates. So uh, again, we are enabling these multiple sensing operations. So you're going to activate several rows at the same time. And this is going to allow us to do it in or or not operations. So uh, this is an example here. Let's say we have several cells. Some of them are open switches. Some of them are resistors. And we are going to activate some target word lines uh, in the same uh, uh, block simultaneously. So when this happens, uh, charge is going to uh, current is going to flow through the bit lines. Some of the the the, the NAND strings that have uh, open switch cells, uh, and the sensing result is going to be zero because like the open switch, the the, the charge cannot uh, the the current cannot flow. But for the ones that uh, all of the cells are are uh, resistor uh, operating as resistors, we are actually going to have. Uh, be a sensing of one. So if there's one, if one is going to be, the output of the sense is going to be one, only if all of the target cells in the NAND string uh, are uh, operating as resistors, so all of them are one. And this is basically an end operation, right? Uh, so by doing this multiple sensing now in the flash cell, again, notes the similar, very similar to what I described for Ambit, uh, we have this end operation. Uh, so yeah, so this is Oracle is called Flash Cosmos and enables bit and operation uh, in the same block by uh, sing, uh, by doing this uh, multiple word line sensing. Again, if you, you can do the same for OR, uh, here is a little bit different from Ambit because we are going to operate uh, with different blocks. So we have different uh, word lines uh, being accessed across different blocks. And when you do that, the output is going to be zero only if all of the of the cells are in, the, in those uh, access word lines are operating as uh, open uh, open uh, open gates. Uh, otherwise, it's going to always be one. And this is basically a, a or operation. Uh, so this also enabling 
This is basically enabling all operations in flash devices. Yeah, there is a, 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 a larger talk about this that uh, Rakesh gave in TechCon this year. I can explain more about this. And later on in future lectures, we're going to talk about uh, uh, um, how this, this flash cross mechanism operates in details. Uh, this uh, using other memory technologies as well, we can do similar things for further computations. If you, in particular, we run cells, uh, you can do uh, dot product operation by leveraging Kirchhoff laws uh, uh, um, of, of um, when you access the DRAM cells. And these are, uh, uh, I think it's better to ex explain over here. Uh, again, you're going to have a lecture on this. But uh, basically, a uh, uh, main restore or a reram cells, uh, you have this array of cells, and uh, a cell itself is going to store uh, data uh, not on, as a capacitor, but, but as a resistive device. And if you try to, uh, so yes, yeah, so I have a bunch of resistors, and they have different uh, res resistive levels over here. And if you pass a current between the, those resistance levels, they will output the current that you're going to observe uh, in the very end of the sensing uh, is equivalent to the Kirchhoff law, applying Kirchhoff law of, of the voltage and the, uh, resist, uh, the resistor levels for those uh, cells. And if you look at this, this is basically a dot product, right? So you have dot product of, uh, product of multiply plus accumulate operation, right? Of these voltage levels and resistive levels. And people have used this a lot to accelerate convolution neural networks because convolution neural networks does a lot of uh, multiply and accumulate. And basically, you are storing you store the weight levels as the, resi the res resistance in the cell, and the, you you have the current, and in the end you have the you have the voltage level that you apply as the uh, inputs for the or the activations, and in the end you have the convolution output uh, as uh, the the sensing values for the cells themselves. And actually, there is a there is a. Uh, a startup in the West, I think it's called Mythic or something, that is developing a, a, a neural network accelerators uh, and selling them based on this particular uh, uh, memory technology here. There is a really nice video from the Veritasium YouTube channel that actually describes and talk with them and shows like their marketing and how it's done. They are, the, the data flow that is applied here is uh, weight stationary. So, in neural networks, you have different ways of, of moving the weights, or either you put the weights and move the activations or the parameter, the activations, or you move you move the weights and keep the activations there. So it's one of weight uh, stationary, or or what is the other one that is called? Yes, yes, yes. what is the name? Input is stationary. So one of the two data flows. So over here is weighted, weight stationary. Did the answer more or less the question? Okay. <laughs> so you can reprogram the weights, but like uh, for a particular convolution, so you program the weights, you put the weights there, you train your neural network. This is for inference. You train your neural network, you put uh, the weights there and store in this uh, memory device as res resistance levels. And then you do a bunch of activations, uh, or sorry, a bunch of convolutions. And if you want to use that to another neural network, you change, you reprogram the cells with another weight, and then you again do a bunch of convolutions and move on, move on, and keep doing that. Is it more or less in your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, good. Uh, so yeah, uh, and then there is a bunch of work that build on this uh, on these uh, devices. They are extremely popular for uh, neural networks uh, much more than processing using DRAM because uh, this is way more efficient for convolution neuro, uh, convolution operations. Uh, so uh, to sum up, uh, does the memory need to be done? Um, I think we answer here that it does not need to. You can re uh, use the memory to do a bunch of uh, uh, capabilities and minimize data movement. And as a summary, this is your last lecture on processing in memory. As overall summary of processing memory, uh, the problem that you are trying to solve over here is that data movement is a main problem in uh, performance and energy in today's systems. This problem is becoming worse and worse because data keep increasing and increasing. Like I keep talking about large language models over here because it's quite important. They are quite get, uh, notorious for creating this data movement problem because the latest 
uh, Llama to uh, model from Facebook. Uh, there is a model that has 77 billion, 770 billion parameters, uh, which uh, does not even fit in my desktop computer here in the ETH that has, I don't know, uh, two, one terabyte of storage. So it's like, it's huge. And, and, this, and then this model keeps just increasing, increasing, increasing size. So this data movement is becoming a main, uh, is, is more of a bottleneck now than, than ever. And processing memory tries to mitigate this bottleneck by move computation where the data resigns. There are two main approaches, processing near memory, which adds logic near the memory design. Think about upmem, think about uh, uh, the Samsung, Samsung solutions, eh, uh, the FIMDURAM, the ones from Alibaba, uh, the ones from SK Highness, AIM, the, all of those works that uh, Juan presented. And then there is this processing using memory solution that uses the memory cells themselves for computation. So Embed through Clone, SimDuram, Pluto, all of those techniques that I presented here today. So uh, adopting processing memory requires quite a lot of changes in the uh, stack, and, and but all of that can be solved uh, use, uh, um, with a mindset, mindset shift. Uh, is there any question related to anything that I talk about today? Yes, and there's a lot of, that is, we are missing research in that field actually, because people tend to think about one or like of these being uh, uh, one alternative to the other, but it's not true because if you think about the upmem system, it, you can have like your logic to uh, outside the bank and it still operate using row clone or embed. The, the one is not, uh, uh, there is nothing here that I, I, I no, no technique that I should hear that one negates the other. They can operate in conjunction for to get better performance. And, and, but we still lack solutions to do that uh, mapping or in or orchestration efficiently across the two techniques uh, being combined together. Any other question? Okay, so again, uh, you are invited to see this uh, live seminar on October 15 at 6 p.m. And uh, this is what I had to talk about processing using memory. And briefly now, I'm going to talk about the history of pushing up those papers, my uh, real clone and embed in particular, and the review process uh, and what you are getting in case you are uh, curious to see how it's like to do uh, like research in, in, in academia. So you go, you write your paper, you write your clone and submit to these uh, top venues. You think the paper is like uh, really nice, right? You, show, you evaluate it, you see a lot of benefits, you evaluate, you do your best efforts to uh, characterize the, the, the limitations and uh, costs behind it. And, and, but then this is usually how it goes. So you submit your paper, uh, and then you get, it's, a, it's an anonymous process. So you don't, uh, whoever, whoever here submits a paper to a conference, I don't know if anyone already had, had that experience. Okay, two people had uh, went through that pain. Uh, so for those others that don't, don't know, usually it's a blind process. So you don't, see the re, you don't see the reviewers, the reviewers don't know who you are. And they read your paper and provide feedback to, for your paper and assign a, gra uh, a grade uh, from, I strong uh, reject this paper. So I think this paper is the worst thing the, in, the, in, the, in the face of the earth. I hate it so much. I don't want to see my, my table anymore. Strong reject or it is strongly accept. This paper is the most beautiful thing that I ever read and I really want it to be published. So, and then there is a, usually a range here, like uh, uh, maybe uh, that is like, uh, I, I want to accept it, but I'm not so sure. So I give a weak accept or I want to reject it, but I'm also not so sure. Maybe there is something here, I give a weak reject. And also uh, it's pretty similar to what you see in the website with, with hot CRP that we actually, the thing that we use, submit the paper is also called hot CRP. And we, uh, and the, we see this type of uh, summary over there. So people usually put, uh, put the strengths and weekends of every paper. And these ones are the ones that we got for the first time that submit uh, the Roclon paper for this conference that's called International Symposium on Computer Architecture in 2023. So yeah, there are the people like uh, papers from, oh, it's uh, really well written background on Durham, it's simple, elegant, really nice. They propose, uh, they show the, the characteristics of Durham, they minimize changes, blah, blah, blah. And then you get the, 
another review, usually you get five to six reviewers uh, and then they, they, they use like, I don't know if the majority of them or it depends, but usually you get anything from four to four, five uh, people uh, giving opinions on your paper. Uh, and then uh, sometimes you, uh, you get good strengths, but then you, the weakness, some of them are nicer than the others. So I'm concerned the applicability of the technique, uh, uh, the evaluation, uh, isn't compelling. Uh, I basically this guy here is saying that I like your paper, but I think useless. Uh, and and then you need to rebut that. So you write a rebuttal and say like, no, my paper is useful because of this, 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 and that reasons. People usually don't get uh, uh, convinced. But anyway, and then you get another reviews. They say like, oh, this idea is not new, uh, but it does not say actually what is the other idea that have done that. So this is quite common. Say like, oh, this idea is has been proposed before, but does not mention before by who. And then like, you're like, oh, but it's like, where is this coming from? So again, you have to rebut that. And then this is the type of system you get. And then you get, uh, in this case here, showing three reviewers. This is core between this one to five that I mentioned. And then in the paper, got rejected. And it's sometimes like, it's really funny because this was published in 2013, uh, submitted in 2013. Two years later, uh, uh, Google pro pro put that paper that I mentioned here that is actually showing that uh, copy and movement of data inside their servers is uh, actually a big problem. And, but two years earlier, the reviewer just said like, this paper is addressing no problem at all, even though it's clearly, Google is like the, ma like the major, um, uh, data center provider showing that actually that is a problem. And then you keep resubmitting because you're a PhD student, everything, like every four months or so you have one of those conferences. And then you submit to another conference, you get another set of reviewers, and then your paper get accepted. So for MB2, for Roclone was, uh, the uh, cycle was just two rounds, was more or less unreasonable. For MB2 it was not so easy. So even though it was the first work to actually show how to do end and or uh, end and or operations in DRAM, uh, people uh, uh, had a lot of um, uh, uh, issues accepting that idea. And even though it was quite a disruptive idea and led to a bunch of works that uh, continues impacting uh, the research community. So I think it was submitted for, yes, for four different conferences and I'm going to show more or less how the reviewers went. So it was, this is the first uh, submission in 2016, was a reject. And uh, initially it was called Bud Durham. Um, so let's see uh, what type of, uh, what the reviewers uh, were talking about. Uh, I wanna show, yes. So this is the summary that you usually get. Paper proposed to extend Durham to include bitwise operations. Uh, strength, very clever idea, novel idea, great potential speed up and benefit. So if everything seems nice, right? Then you go to the weakness, probably won't ever be built. No practical to assume that Durham manufacturers will cha uh, change Durham in this way. A problem that I mentioned before that Durham manufacturers are quite reluctant to right, to change Durham. Yeah, this might be a valid com concern, but like, uh, are we working for these three Durham manufacturers in the world? Not, right? You're trying to do research and show that we can do great things. So this is not necessarily a great uh, argument. Uh, and this continue, like I found this idea very interesting, uh, but uh, the biggest problem is that that is uh, underestimates the difficulties in what find the Durham, even though the, the changes are really small, right? I show the area overheads that it adds is really, really minor. Uh, but yeah, you get this type of claims. Uh, they required, uh, this required modification to DRAM that we only help this type of bitwise operation is unlikely that it's going to be adopted. Uh, so th there is this pro concern as well that reviewers like to forecast the future. Uh, and it, it like, we are, this is, this is not science, right? You like, there is, uh, you can, you, you can, you should keep your, um, your, uh, um, uh, like this type of personal thoughts, uh, away from the review process, right? Because not the scientific method. Uh, and then this goes on and goes on, it's not going to be implemented, it's not feasible, and not the review from ISCA. Um, I do not find architecture innovations, even though should, this is the first paper that is showing how to do and then or uh, with that way. And, and then we'll submit it to another conference. And at some point it gets accepted uh, to, I don't know, I think it's not, 
Ah, uh, yes, in micro 2017. So this takes time, this takes effort. Uh, it's really annoying as a researcher to have to deal with this type of reviewers. And usually we try to make, uh, in our papers, you're going to see this. We thank the reviews for, yeah, ISCA 2016, 17, micro 2016, 17, HPCA for the value commons. Uh, we are trying to make the reviewers value, uh, accountable here. Sometimes the reviewers are actually helpful and then try to if you improve your papers. But often there is like these arguments like, oh, this is not going, to, never going to be manufactured. Like that you have to just like read it, brief and like move on with your life because there is nothing that you can do over there. And again, uh, you can always reject a paper based on um, these red holes uh, and they are not necessarily a scientific way uh, of doing things. Another problem is that people are, uh, don't like to change. So why am I going to change my Dura manufacturing process to enable computation uh, if it's my system is working as it is right now, right? So why I would bother? So this is another good, like a, another uh, uh, bad argument to reject idea or reject a paper. Just uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, being opposed to change. So this is just a, a overall suggestion for you as a reviewer when you are reviewing the papers for uh, the lecture. Try to be fair when you are reading a paper. Try to be open-minded uh, for ideas. Uh, try to be accepted to uh, diverse ideas and uh, research methods. Try to be constructive. Try to put uh, how this could be improved instead of how this could be uh, dismiss uh, and try to think about uh, how you can enable heterogeneity uh, in ideas. This is usually what leads to innovation. And, and, and this is like, uh, yeah, this is what happens when you don't follow those and you have a closed mind that in the end you're blocking scientific progress from happening uh, as soon as they should. And this is a problem in the research. We should focus on, uh, we should make reviewers accountable. And the research community also need to be accountable. You can find several lectures of this on honor and actually how to do research in an impactful way. And, and then I guess it's the most important slide if you ever want to do research. Uh, that is, you need to be quite resilient. So that like the papers, you, every single process is like a pain. You're going to find really unfair uh, reviews out there. But uh, you need to keep trying to improve our work and believe on your work. And when, because when the work is good, it eventually uh, uh, it's going to be published and eventually you're going to see the impacts of that work. And impact is actually what actually matters uh, in the very end of all of this. And yeah, for, so we're trying to focus on learning and scholarship and the quality of our work is in the end going to define your uh, research. Uh, I guess there's yeah, some more. Uh, points of the talk that is this interview with owner that he talks a lot about this and uh i suggest his reading is from uh uh does anyone know who research hemming is is it something really famous hemming codes i don't know it's, it's from this guy anyway he's a person that did that and he has this talk you and your research and over here he's just basically saying that uh you need to know yourself know your weakness know your limitation uh, try to work on important problems, get involved on those in work on these in, in, uh, uh, important problems and not try to just uh, count on luck. Just improve, uh, uh, do good work, believe on your work, uh, try to mitigate your limitations that eventually you're going to become a, a great scientist. And I was just on time, uh, really good for a Brazilian. Thank you so much, uh, everyone for listening. I don't know. There are any burning questions? I'll be glad to take. Otherwise, we're done for today. Okay. Thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>